the term. It's, it's a universal basic income sounds like, oh, everyone's just going to get money. But when you say universal basic human needs, that's different. It's not that's like, that. oh, like when we when all agree go... that there's certain things that we shouldn't have to fucking worry about, like food, clean water, fucking basic stuff, like a place to live in the fucking greatest country in the world that you're calling it, no? So, oh, we are all agreeing that there's certain things that we all need. Here's the money, you should spend it on them, but we're not going to limit on what you spend it. If you approach it that way, it seems more reasonable, right? Then if you say that, yeah, we're going to give everybody two grand a month. They're like, oh, nobody's going to do shit. It's different, you know? Right. Right, this chat is one more time and right. we're live again. <laughs> um, right, episode we 15. After there we go. There we go. After plenty of sound check, it had to be because you know we are talking to a music producer, sound technician. Dude, no, I'm gonna let you. I'm not gonna do the disgraceful uh, dishonor of trying to go through your resume because uh, I, I know it's a, a long one. I was on on it's what was it? Clubhouse. I was on Clubhouse and I was reading your description today, and I was like, "Damn, dude! Like, you did some pretty cool shit." So I'm with Remy, but from here on, you know, take the mic. Then. Tell me a bit about yourself, you know, just before we start diving into other conversations. All right, Damn so throats <laughs> dry. <clears throat> I guess if we're going through the the whole resume kind of thing, um, audio engineer. I've started off playing drums and then went to school for mechanical engineering, and then I was like, "This is dumb. I <laughs> this is not made for me. This is not my journey." Switched to music and technology. Never looked back since. Uh, did a lot of work in studio engineering, was a monitor at the, the recording studio on campus. So I basically ran like a key swipe access. I was the one basically running the studio. Uh, and I was the one that like pretty much knew the system better than anybody else. Like the there were professors that turned over while I was still working there. And yeah. I was explaining how the studio worked to some of the professors that were in charge of the studio. Damn. Like just because I was just there longer than the right. professors over there. You had more um, experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were like, of course, they're phenomenally smarter than I was. I just knew the actual tech and the systems that were right. in that room. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, and then since then, uh, I got really involved in the Recording Academy's college program, which was Grammy U my senior year, and ended up interning for the Recording Academy in their New York office for a semester. Over quarantine, I've been working on uh, making a lot of music with a lot of other songwriters, producers, um, and two main ventures that have taken up a lot of my time, which is Stock, actually the shirts that we're wearing right now. There and we go, then... dope t-shirts. I have the white one too. We got both of them. That's it's yeah. crazy. Uh, Stythebrand.com if anybody's looking to check it out. Um, yep. That link will be up there. As well as Museum, the company that me and Vlad are starting with our friend Mark, Kira, and Margaret. Damn. Uh, and that's been that's been an adventure of itself. That's it. For me, I've been trying to find ways of setting the groundwork for a lot of the work that I want to continue to do for the rest of my life, and just right start doing that now. Uh, Museum, I see as a side of doing the music stuff, right? For me, Museamp is a space for me to approach the audio engineering that I'm doing, the artist development work that I love doing in a very business-minded and team-focused environment. Right. And so style... what is it? What is like Museamp for people? Because I know I, I've talked about it before, but for people that are just hearing this, like what is Museamp in, you know, just a few simple words? You know, I would rather you explain it because you're the head of the marketing <laughs> department. <laughs> Uh, all right and i, I mean i and like as much as i know the music set like you the that's way a fair point put the package together is something i can't compete with so like definitely i'm definitely adding that to you <laughs> okay so as a side note museamp is a service that we're building in which we have mentors um that specialized in marketing and social media on one side and then mentors that are specialized in music producing uh, mastering and you know most some of them even have both skills you know like mark for example uh, he does a bit of social media 
marketing. He, he has a sick, um, you know, social media game. He posts everywhere. And so do you, man. And, and you know what I love about, like, pretty much everybody on the team? Yeah. They dip their toes in, like, everything. Regardless yep. of, like, what we specialize in. Like, even Kira has a lot of, like, artist development and, like, umbrella branding. Right. Yeah, like, you're running a podcast, like, and you are right. you know all of these audio things. So, it's it's nice to be able to communicate in ways, like, we can communicate with the actual uh, language. Yeah. And no one gets confused, which is nice. Exactly. <laughs> like, everyone knows the terms that we're throwing around, in a, especially in a music startup. So... What we do is we get these mentors and there's a plenty of up and coming artists and even like, you know, established artists who, uh, you know, maybe they make great music, but they can't seem to market themselves or find the one thing that sets them apart, their story, you know? So what Museum can do for them is on the marketing side is, you know, find that story behind them, what makes them special <clears throat> and mentor them in branding themselves on you know, social media, but also yeah. we go as far as creating the content and, uh, you know, generating all that monthly content, you know, d depending on what the needs are, you know, helping you launch a certain album. And on the music side, you're getting like surgery done basically on your music. If you want, you know, yeah. uh, we do get anywhere from, from mentorship to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you tell me, we're doing everything from, uh, so working with, you know, you have a project and you want some feedback to, the brand kind of stuff, which is helping you fine tune how you're making music, the processes that you're using in your life to be productive in your music career right. and setting up templates and making sure that workflow is moving smoothly. Right. So we, we both do project and brand based with the brand base specifically is something I'm super excited about because I feel like it's something that doesn't always get a lot of attention on the music side. Right. Sorry, I had to mute it because I live on the street uh, with the fire department. I know I said yeah. that many times <laughs> in our meeting. So it means that any single time that there is a fire, anything that the firemen are needed for in our neighborhood, the one street they must always take because they t cannot take a right, so they must take a left, is towards us on our street. And so every single time, like every two, three hours, there's definitely fire, like a That's fire hilarious. truck. So, I feel like you never realize how often things go down unless you yeah. live next to one of those places. Yeah. Yeah. So like the amount of times that you can hear, like it's an Easter egg on my podcast. You can pretty much hear fire truck almost in every other episode. <laughs> and at this point, I don't even care. Like I'm just leaving it. But this time it was like obnoxiously close. Like I think it was like you was going to be loud for you, you know? So anyways. Yeah. Um, yes. So for Musamp, like, we, like you said, we... On the music side, you also uh, b basically pretty much get your hands dirty. And what I like to also emphasize is that we work with you. It's not just like a consultancy where we tell you what to do and then go do it. I mean, you can have that option too if you don't want us to get like in your project too much. But our main offer is, hey, we will work side by side with you. You have a whole team at your disposal and we'll help to create something pretty pretty cool. And that's pretty much what Museamp is. And uh, your role in there is your your music mentor, like you said, like you mentioned already. Yeah. And what are some of the things that you've had to do so far? Because I know we've tested a few people. Uh, we we've we've worked with a few people already. Yeah. So one, uh, which I really like doing is just analyzing music. Right. I right. one of the things I regularly do is just sit down and go through like the new music Friday, every single Friday for at least a few hours, I sit down and I just go through all of the new releases. I look at right. what came out. Uh, I usually have a couple of things that I'm looking forward to because I heard of artists that were dropping stuff during the week. Um, and I literally sit there to listen to things that I can add to my swipe file. Uh, for me, my swipe file, if you've ever heard of the book, Steal Like an Artist, swipe file is basically just a file of things that, give you that every time you listen to them they just give you inspiration right. right and right now i actually don't know how many songs is on that file i think i have around 50 ish and to put that in perspective for me there's not a lot of songs because of the fact that i tend to have like at least like 300 songs on a small playlist 
because wow. I just add them. Because I just add because they go by yeah. genre, and I've been adding them for years on Spotify. Right. So it, wait, let me just. I want to get the actual. No, I can't do that. Yeah, right now there's only like four hours of music on this playlist, which I which, which is not but much. it's not bad. Four hours, pretty good. Yeah, four hours is like not that bad. Four hours is like. Maybe like sixty songs, eighty songs, something like that. Right, like, what genre is it? Because songs. Like, okay, yeah, that's pretty decent. Yeah, and I, like it. The nice thing about it is that it spreads across all the genres. That's the big thing on the swipe file players. For me, it's I can go in there and find something in pretty much any piece of music that I would be looking for. That's building a pretty good like content base as well. Yeah, like you just access at any point you're like out of ideas you can access it at any point that's what a swipe file is basically yeah um i i remember i had my one of my playlists uh well i still have it it's called (laughs) solid rap and i started it when i was i think in 10th grade you know i knew because in 10th grade i definitely knew what solid rap was well i have to say you know growing up in spain i didn't have the exposure to as much i shouldn't have had as much exposure to american rap and Dude, by the time I was in ninth grade, I was I listened I had known about like NWA, Easy. I was listening to Easy E. I mean, Dr. Dre and Eminem. I'd been listening to for like years already. You know, I remember what's seeing funny? MTV when things, it was Eminem. Like it was crazy. You know what's so funny? All of those things that you found as a kid in Spain, yeah. I didn't hear about until like four years ago. Really? I'm dead ass. Like I but. It wasn't in Spain. It was honestly like, well, Eminem started in Romania, but NWA started in Spain just because of my exposure to like certain international kids and then just yeah. YouTube. And then I started researching Eminem and then I started researching like the whole, you know, uh, yeah. Interscope it's- and everyone. And then I was like, oh, wait, Dr. Dre, I researched it. And then I, I started getting to NWA way before the movie blew up, you know, and that's when everybody started yeah. listening to them. But, you know. I was like, damn, I like, I love it. Tupac, Biggie. I knew so many, like, Tupac, like, Dear Mama. Like, wow, no, I knew all of them. And I knew, like, no rap, which was hilarious. Really? Because now it's, like, my, like it's literally all I listen to, but I knew almost no rap. Because I didn't, I grew up, like, a suburb where no one listened to it. I, not a lot of people in my family listen to it in general. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Like, Central Jersey. Central New oh, Jersey. Oh, cool. <laughs> what do you guys so, listen over there? <laughs> It was it was a lot of all over the place, um, but it it wasn't like that like old school, especially like the old school hip hop. I didn't hear a lot of. I the most I heard of was like some LL Cool J. Like I knew wow, LL Cool J okay. when most people wouldn't know LL Cool J. But yeah, most of the stuff that was in popular culture in like eighties, nineties, I didn't listen to a lot. You know what's funny? I knew Run DMC, um, dude. Come on. Yes, that's the kind of stuff that I knew when yeah. I was. Uh, it was a lot of Run DMC, but I also knew about uh, Wu Tang. No, 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 no. I I didn't know about. Well, Wu-Tang. that was later. That's one. Well, I actually didn't know yeah. about Wu Tang, um, either until college. There was one that did. Oh my god, I can't remember the name of the the band, but they did the song "I'm So Horny." Have you? Do you know what I'm talking? I'm looking it up. I'm looking it up right now. Wait. Yeah, two live crew. I knew about two live two crew. Two live crew. Yeah. But I didn't know about it the rest. Do you know about two live crew? No, I don't actually. Okay. So, I'm just going to sum up their importance in the music industry. I actually don't two know live, about them. Wow. Two live crew is the whole reason like the explicit sticker exists. <laughs> really? Like, at, like they they tried He's to so censor. horny. We want some pussy. 1988. What are you? Dude, they tried right. to. So basically, Two Live Crew was the first ones to do like some seriously sexual shit and some music, right? Damn. And like the you know typical suburban white people in America tried to like get it censored, basically yeah. say it was illegal. And a lot of places did say it was. Uh, there were some states that said it's illegal to sell this record. Oh right, my and God. they would they would arrest they would like raid record stores and arrest people that were selling that record, um, and then they the two live crew went all the way to the Supreme Court to say that they couldn't censor that, right? Basically under like the freedom of speech thing. So and then eventually they were like, all right, well, we're not we can't like stop them from selling. We're just gonna put this explicit sticker on it, 
Um, and I may be summarizing it a lot, and I may be a little bit off on exactly how that transferred but into the makes explicit sense. figure. But yeah, they were the first ones to like go all the way to the Supreme Court to fight. And, like, uh, <laughs> Damn, Where, what year was that? Music. Do you know, like, or or the decade at least? Eighties? I could I could tell you as soon as I look up Two Left Crew because they were from the nineteen eighty four to nineteen ninety eight active. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was like early. And then from two thousand nine to two thousand sixteen, yeah. you know. So the as nasty as they want to be is like nineteen eighty nine. Okay, yeah. So it was like late eighties, early nineties. When did that, fuck that the one. police come out? Because I think as nasty as they want to be, like nineteen eighty eight. It was at the same time, so yeah, all basically of that was at the same time. Wow, yeah, because they were getting like arrested after shows for playing the song and shit. That's crazy. I didn't I know can't. that. There I didn't know about one... Two Life Crew. Yeah, so like, uh, we want some pussy was uh eighty seven. Okay. Right? Yeah, and so that, that was, was the the years. Yeah, it was like that was when everything started going down. The wow. Years, yeah, it popped off. But uh, yeah, so I knew a lot. Like two live crew was like the kind of stuff that I listened to because the things that uh, permeated like popular culture a lot in the right. early eighties, right? Just because, uh, and I have it over there somewhere. I won't fish it out while I actually. You know, what? I might fish it out. Fish oh it. wait, I know what it is. I'm gonna go grab it. Fish it, fish it. All right. So while everybody else had iPods, you know, I had this Zoom, which was basically oh. Microsoft Microsoft's attempt to compete with the ipod and it did pretty well for a second and then eventually as you know the ipod was just like all right why am i going to get anything else other than the ipod right the biggest thing was the itunes store and how everything worked and yeah all that but this is what i had and this was all of the music that i listened to it rarely got updated with new music and it just had a bunch of music on here and that was just that was it that was what i had and i had i would have I had a, some like old old reggaeton, like Looney Tunes kind of stuff. <laughs> no way. Yeah, so that was Damn. and I would play that like I didn't I think it had El Barrio Fino from Daddy Yankee that I played a lot, but the, the golden and then it days. had Yeah, but it didn't have most of the other albums. Like the earliest stuff was like that yeah. and then Looney Tunes, like the Looney Tunes album that had everybody on it. Right. That was the album that I had on. Yeah, I remember um, the videos that they put up with all these like people in one fucking room. These like yeah. low budget girls. <laughs> At that yeah. point for them, it was awesome. The the good raw reggaeton days. Damn, that's so crazy. I, fight these relics. So yeah, but the other thing was like I didn't know anything about anything other than the music. Like I yeah. literally knew this the album covers because I was just a visual person and it always showed the album covers when it played the song. So I yeah. knew all of the album covers from all of the songs that I liked. Yeah, and I knew like the actual songs and the names that were on the songs. I knew nothing about who the people were. I knew nothing about what any of the songs meant in culture. I knew absolutely nothing about what happened in the music industry. I knew nothing. I knew you just liked the way they sounded. I listened to music all of the time, and I knew that they went on vinyls, and I knew I played them in the car, and I knew they carried emotions. Like that was that was that was that's so cool, man. I yeah. I was that that's so cool. So you were basically listening to stuff not because you knew the whole context, just because of pure like you just yeah. liked the, it was just like the song music. It was literally just music that I would find music, on here. Yeah. Um, like I and I would listen to that stuff. I I remember one of the songs that I used to play on like repeat all of the time was like "Whole Lot of Love" by Led Zeppelin. Ooh, yeah. For some reason, that was just I remember there was a couple years straight where I, like I would only play like every time I got in the car that was the first song I played. Um. Two Princes by the Spin Doctors was another one that I still have stuck in my head to this day for some reason. Um, I knew like some Animals and Smiths records because like that that was like what was popular yeah. in like the the eighties. The eighties, yeah. And then um, some early two thousand stuff. Obviously, like there was, I had grunge on this and all of that <laughs> stuff that happened in the nineties, but like. 
I li- I would listen to some of it, uh, like the Offspring, Nirvana, whatever, whatever. Right. Um, that's just what I grew up being around. Of it course. wasn't like the stuff that I was like. Was it your parents like, that like? Yeah, it was my father. Music? Like this was. Mm. My father was the one with the the server and the com- he would have he was like a computer guy so he had like a server on the basement with all the music on it and then yeah. he would put all of it on here. Oh, that's um, cool. And then he would play all the rock stations and he was the one that was like, I need to have the big, I need to have a subwoofer in my car and right. have nice speakers. <laughs> like it was he was that guy. Um, not that my mom wasn't about that either. It was just my dad was the one that kind of took it to to another took level. action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He 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 was a little extra about it um yeah so i ended up that was one thing that i got from him because he used to be a dj too um back in like when he was in high school like eight basically. so he did a bit of everything as well it was cool yeah um that was kind of why i got to grow up with records and like actual vinyl records in the basement and know how a turntable works and have giant cabinet speakers and stuff like that so it's not like you got into music later in your life or when the mainstream wave of uh, yeah. young producers hit in 2014, yeah, no. 13. I got, I was always like listening to music and then I played drums for like forever, right? I yeah. did a whole bunch of drumline stuff in, uh, in high school, played jazz band and all of that in like middle school especially and then went on tour for like three years for drum, for as part of the, the drum course that I was touring with. And then I realized that there was a whole industry behind music. And I was like, oh, well, if I can do this, why would I do anything else? Right. Yeah. Um, it was, that's how I'm here. It's it's incredible that... Wait, you, so you graduated already. And yes, I did. you're obviously not... What are you What are you doing right now? Like you told me, um, you're working on something. Well, first, I, like later, I want to get into style. I want you to tell me all about it. Yeah. But but first, like I think you were telling me, you're working right now. Like you have a work schedule, right? Yeah. What's your... So the work schedule isn't anything fancy. Like I literally just have like a part time at Guitar Center to pay for like groceries while I'm doing all of this other stuff. And That's all cool. The other stuff is like Sty, Museum. Uh, all of the writing sessions and the the music that I'm writing with uh, the artists that I'm working with and the songwriters that I'm working with, uh, trying to be involved in things like Clubhouse and Quadio platforms that I think have potential to be bigger later on. Yeah. And just kind of set and also take into account like what I want to do in general, like as a person on earth. Right. Um, and for me, the two biggest things are obviously music. And then supporting creatives and the next generation of creatives, specifically through um, connecting with them, with people that look like them, and with basically uh, providing support for creative education, right? Uh, telling, trying to, to, to put out there that if you want to do music, like there's an industry behind music, and you don't like you don't have to be a rock star or be a music teacher to do music. There's a hole in between. Right. Um, to try and encourage and like provide avenues for people to actually do that. I saw on Clubhouse you were like trying to uh, make this meeting, right? This gathering with your high school, with people from your high school to Not like that, talk about creative careers. So that's actually, I want to start talking at high schools like this. Okay. Year. Okay. Okay. I want to, okay. yeah. I want to start talking to high school students. Uh, start okay. doing presentations with high school students and talking about careers and in creative industries like design, marketing, uh, entrepreneurship, music, um, all of these things that kind of get glossed over by the general education system, which oftentimes just promotes test taking and being uh, the, the conformist a little bit. Right. Uh, so I really want to start giving talks and having like events for students that want to go do something that maybe a lot of society doesn't say is valuable although that's they use it every single day right you're an artist you're gonna starve (laughs) yeah it's like it's that and it's like there's a whole music business degree like it's yep no one knows about it like it's just how many people know that music business exists how many people even like 
There's so many. It's right in front of their eyes, you know, but they can't seem to figure it out. It's but part of it is it's not right in front of their eyes because so many people never come in contact with somebody that works in music. Right, but they listen to the music. They pay for stuff, and they just never constantly. They never think about all of the roles that go into the music and the the movies that they watch and the whatever. Like it's yeah, the score yeah. Yeah, it only has value when they consume it, but at every other point in their life, it's like, no, this is not value. You're never going to be able to get value from doing this. Right, yeah. And I think that's, it's kind of backwards. I think the biggest thing is, and this is really with anything, it's like, no one's really going to have a great career in something that they aren't actually passionate about. Because if you aren't actually passionate about the subject that you're working in, the most you're going to be is mediocre. Yeah. Because the, in order to be explain that a more, bit, like what to, do you mean by mediocre? Like, do you mean that you can try and achieve your dreams, but if you're not made for it, you're just gonna be, you know, meh at it? Here's what I mean by if you aren't putting a passion into it, you you won't be anything more than mediocre. Is in order to be anything more than mediocre, it requires. Like that whole, you got to put in 10,000 hours, 10,000 reps. You got to, right. you got to be willing to work every day at it. The only way you're actually going to be able to do that is if you have motivation to do that on a daily basis. If you want to. Yes. Yeah. Not That's, that, not that you need to do it. Most of the feel, days you want to. If you feel like you need to do it, then yeah. maybe you can get yourself to do eight hours a day, which is a full-time job. Yeah that's what a bunch of people in the United States do. Yeah. This this will get me money and I can do th- I can handle this for 8 hours out of the day. Yep. Um but then the other part of it is when you're doing something that isn't actually fulfilling or you don't find gratifying or you don't find that actually challenges you, then you're basically exhausting yourself doing the work you're basically forcing yourself to do something that you don't want to do and then when you get out of it you're exhausted which is why so many people go from a job to watching tv yep. to a job to watching tv to sleep especially watching now TV. that you cannot go anywhere so you have like you don't even have to tell people anymore i don't want to go out you know it used to be yeah. a thing like oh i gotta go out because people are going out now it's like i can go home do not i'm gonna i'm home and then yeah. I'm, I'm from here and then i go on the couch like it's crazy but then when you're doing something you're actually passionate about, it isn't, it's, it can get tiring in a different way. It's like, if you enjoy going to the gym, you're going to get tired because your muscles are getting tired, but you're going to be able to probably push yourself to a further limit because you enjoy the process of getting stronger in the gym, right? If you, and if if you, you like it, you can obsess over it. Yeah. And if you like it, you can push yourself a little bit. You're going, you're not going to talk yourself into you don't have to talk yourself out of quitting. You need to talk yourself out of going too far. Overworking, yeah, yeah. literally. And yeah. That's that literally that difference is the difference between get being mediocre in a thing and taking yourself to a point where you are somebody that not only is one of the best at what they do, but also is recognized as one of the leading voices in an in industry in uh, practice in pretty much everything. Right, you want longevity <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, I found out that people sometimes tend to tend to think that if they keep working and they keep burning themselves throughout the day, it's gonna get them far. And you know what? For some people, maybe it works. But I ask it those doesn't. people always the same thing. I'm like, okay, it works. You're making money because there are there are people who work constantly, 18 hour days, and they're making fuck ton of money. But I'm asking them, okay, if you were to be a bit more, to give yourself some time to rest. And if you were to give yourself some time to disconnect from what you're doing, don't you think you would, one, earn more money since that's what you seem to care about? Two, have more time to enjoy the fact that you're getting money. Most people just want to work to see their ego and their money grow, right? So like, well, the, the, what if you like give yourself a break? Because overworking can it's part of that, and then decrease productivity. Get conditioned to chase something. Yeah, they're, they're like, if, they're, if I don't work 18 hours a day, I'm falling behind the market. I'm falling behind everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And they're conditioned to be like, I need more money. I need more money because they yeah. have this complex of being scared of being broke or they were conditioned by the people that they're up with that money is the most important thing. 
Um, yeah, and there's, and there's, a, there's people a lot that of think, factors. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Like, there's people no, that think good. that pe these people, like, uh, get some people want to get rich just because they keep, they want to buy stuff. But my theory is that most people that are attaining this highly, like, fucking Jeff Bezos, it's not because they want to get more rich and buy more shit. It's because the money that they, it's, they just want to see the money grow. And sometimes people say, oh, it's power. No, dude. Sometimes it's just as simple as seeing a fucking number grow. It's pure gamification, bro. That's one. And then two is like, if the game was power. Yeah. And they would game for power. They wouldn't be yes. gaming for just money. Because exactly. Because money, because money is a holding place for power. Right. But at the end of the day, that like, once you get to a certain point, the money isn't as important. But for like... If you're, uh, what's his name? Fucking the Tesla guy. What's his name? Elon Musk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I don't know why I forgot <laughs> his name when I hear it every day. But if you're like Elon Musk, for him, it's not about the money. It's like, no, nah, I want to put people on Mars and be able to make computers out of people's brains. Right. What he's about to that do like, is about to be become more valuable than everything that's here. So what the fuck? That's like, how do you price that? And part of it is like, Half the times when you're powerful, the right. you end up making a lot of money in the process. Like Amazon, like Elon Musk, not Elon Musk, fucking Jeff Bezos. I'm, now I'm screwing up names. Jeff Bezos. That's okay. I have a I have a hypothesis that he wasn't like in the beginning. Maybe it was like I need money, but it, like I feel like a lot of I have a hypothesis that he's not chasing the money. That's the, like he's not chasing money. The thing isn't money. The thing right. is control. Yes. Like, if you see a lot of what Amazon does, it's about control. Controlling the market. Controlling where people buy things. Controlling uh They're how... getting into space now again, as, as well. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and he's just... And everything. If you... I feel like if you look at a lot of the moves that Jeff Bezos has, even if, when he goes back to when he used to do, like, predatory things of... um. Uh, you know, seeing what was selling on Amazon, then just like making it for Amazon itself, like putting it through Amazon Basics or something like that. Like he used, to, they used to right. do. That for me is less, a little less about money, and a little bit more about control. Yes, the money comes, but it's like not necessarily the driving factor. It's about having the control of having them always going to Amazon. Right. And like I not to say think... it could completely be about money. It could. It could just be about the gamification of money and just having run up the tap. It could. But I think sometimes within that money, it comes down to like a, a need for control. Yeah. Sometimes with some people, and maybe it's not Jeff Bezos, maybe Jeff Bezos isn't some people, but it can turn into that because money isn't, it's a piece of paper at the end of the day. It, it, it symbolizes different things for different people. Some people, it's like money is like, all right, I can control what I I can control this. Or now I have, for some people, money symbolizes freedom. And the right. more money they have, the more free <clears throat> they are to do whatever they want. For some people, money means evil. And they think that the more money somebody has, the more evil that they are and the more predatory that they are. Like yeah. There are people that, I know people that legitimately believe every billionaire is the devil. Because oh they, my god to, those people to... that think yeah like oh my god everyone every billionaire and not to say that maybe they're not you know who knows who the fuck knows but every billionaire like, in order to be a billionaire needed to do something to stomp somebody else out yeah and also they're like and i don't want to get it like i don't get i don't want to get into politics but like oh they have so many billions if they would just give away this and be like okay let me tell you the amount of like community things you could solve if you were like at a scale that if you were to give away half of your salary paycheck, same scale of thing. And what the, everyone's asking is how can this some um, many people or this small group of people own the majority of Earth's wealth, right? And without again going into capitalism versus whatever. Uh, I don't even want. I don't. I don't want to have the keyword, you know, because YouTube now gets your um, algorithm. I don't want to even say it. Without that, people are like, "Oh no, they got their bad, bro." I don't care, Jeff. Do you, I like to see that picture of Jeff Bezos whenever he started out. Like at the bottom of everything, these people put their fucking heart out to get where they are. The kind of shit they're doing with their money, 
pretty fucking shady. What the fuck are you going to do about it? <laughs> what can you do about it? Like, what are you going to do? Do you put a cap on how much money? Like, imagine, what are they going to do now? Should they put a cap on how much money you're going to make when they're going to start mining asteroids? At the end of the day, it's... People are scared of people between... getting wealth. That's that's what they're scared about. But people no. getting power and people getting more powerful than they are. Yes, that that's the that's the key point. It's like people are people start getting scared when they feel like something else is starting to make them feel insignificant. That happens right. a lot. Um, but at the same time, at every point in somebody's life, you kind of have to go. There are people that have reached a billion dollars through. Yes, they've had their privilege, but they've only been alive for so long. So it's like, all right, you are, you have the same amount of years as they do. If they're 60 and they have a billion dollars, what are you doing at 20 to have a billion right. dollars when you're 60? Right. It's you, we, we can't control whatever other privilege somebody else has. And the only way you're going to control the, the reaches of power at which somebody else can attain is if you're in a position where you actually control that yeah um, or you have in amount or you have the numbers in which of people to control that right um and that's the part that it's like all right complain you have a complaint what now yeah and a lot of people just skip over the what now they complain and they don't get to the what now and at the end of the day, it comes down to the people that are looking to bring value to them, like looking to, to capitalize, I guess capitalism, capitalize on the opportunities that are available. Yeah. And those that are prioritizing comfortableness and uh, consumer behavior. And this, they just the... want to consume the things that are available. Exactly. I think it's the market is going to divide like this. And I have absolutely, I have half a semester of microeconomics because I quit after that. And I went to creative writing, obviously. So, so you have micro, I did macro. So together, you did macro. Have... <laughs> I wish I would have done fucking macro. It's sounded Yo, more macros, interesting. Macro is actually the shit. <laughs> yeah. No, a, like when you have a good professor, if you have a shit yeah. professor, it's going to be shitty. But if no, the professor, professor was fine. It was just, I was like, oh my God, no, nah, man. No, I don't give a, a shit about this. Like macro is like, like learning okay so when you're on the news and they're talking about gdp it right. sounds like the stupidest most boring fucking thing ever but yeah. when you're in macro and you actually look at what the value of a nation is it's how it's not only is it kind of hilarious but it also makes uh what's that what's that fucking uh video game where you build a nation uh the imp age of empires no, uh, no, no, no 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 the one where you're like a dictator on an island oh shit what's that game oh it's gonna bother me now is it wait is it a pc or is it an app like is it a gaming like on the phone or a game on the computer no, no, no. It's, like a, it's like a game like you can play it on uh you can play it on like playstation and stuff like i used to play it on playstation but it's not like a 60 dollar game it's like a 20 dollar game Oh, I I don't know. I don't know. Fuck! Oh, it's gonna bother me. Sims? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's like it's kind of like Civilization, but you know how Civilization. Oh yeah. War. Yeah. There's another one that's like based on creating an island and having an economy, but also having soldiers and defense and. Oh, that's it, pretty cool. It's just it's wild. It's actually kind of addicting, and I, I played it for like a couple like two weeks. There, uh, one of the guys in the fraternity house has it, and I played it like every day, and I was like, okay. I'm stopping now because <laughs> I feel like there was, there came a point for me where I needed to look at where I was spending my time yeah, and why I was spending my time there. And I felt, I saw that a lot of, there were a lot of situations where things like this game or other games, for example, like you get an addiction from building things. Right. Right. And I enjoyed the building thing. And I just realized I was playing those games because I felt like I wasn't getting that from my actual life. Wow, that's deep, yeah. Nah, like you weren't using that like, creative power in your life. And it's like, all right, if you enjoyed creating things like that, then 
how about instead of paying thirty dollars to do this in a game where you'll never actually get value back to you, you just be like Jeff Bezos and play Empire with an actual Empire. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There was this uh, post. The really real quick thing was like a uh, quick mindfulness uh, exercise for creative people. Uh, take two nights on one night consume content that's within like whatever you like you know so for me it's like copywriting marketing so i don't know i'll just watch people do their stuff or like learn about them and then the next night do that like create that and then both nights record how you felt and how you felt in comparison and you will see that when you sit down and actually create it feels so much better or wait that was my personal thing you know it's a practice yeah. everyone can maybe some people feel better consuming but like you said it's just when you start creating it's it's a different world i think and that goes back to something an exercise oh and did let for- me not forget sorry because we went from macroeconomics i just want to make sure that we have some train of thought what i was thinking what i was thinking about uh microeconomics and then you can continue is yeah. i think the market is about to divide into uh consumers and the and the gig market there's going to be a gig market for everything people are going to start realizing that other yeah. people can fix problems that they don't want to fix you know i realize that because that's what i'm there but to do for realize, some people but if you realize the whole point of having a company is doing that exactly that's all a company does that's so not everyone's going to make their own company having a marketing person and having a branding person exactly and the only difference between having a company like a don't worry, I smack my whole time. The only difference between having a, a marketing person inside of a company and a marketing person that you signed by contract is if you hire the person in their in your company to do marketing, one, 100% of their attention is on you. Two, yep. you're providing all of their income or the large majority of their income. And the last one is like... Um, Oh, I forgot the third one. I forget the third one. I'm just going to say it. I forgot the third thing. But basically, <laughs> if if you're in a gig economy, it's like, all right, I'm going to contract you for this service. Now, the marketing person has their own brand that they're responsible for building. One. Two, you are basically hiring them for what you need. Right? And you can contract them for more, and you contract them for less. And like, I feel like a lot of people are starting to realize, oh, I could do this, and also, this means I don't have to be co-located with people, or I don't have to handle this right. taxes. I just give them the money, and they handle it. Yeah, and that's that's a thing that's getting to be complicated. And this whole shift, a lot of this, uh, these problems, considering like taxes and you know people not being paid enough, and people getting hustled out of paycheck. It's that's what I'm it's, saying. That's what we're. Sti- I think that's what we're staying towards. It's a big thing around the infrastructure not being able to, not being used to this kind yeah. of economy, and then people being like, "Oh yeah, we could do this." I think, and again, I hate this, but I think they just they're not giving people money. They're not gonna give people money for a while. Then they're gonna be like, "Here, we have the solution from now on. Two grand a month for everybody. No more competition, except for the people that want to keep doing their own thing. So everybody gets two grand." And on yeah. top of that, you work as much as you want and you do whatever gig. And what's going to happen? I think happen? it's going to turn into Most that of the two people, grand is going to be like a it's going to be like a pay for your groceries kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be like rent, groceries and bare minimum. And then half of the people are going to be like, "Sweet, I'm not doing a fucking single thing other than that for the rest of my life." And the rest of the people are going to start b- building businesses for them. So this the world is about to be divided into people who create yeah. and to people who consume. I mean, it already is divided into that, but now it's going to be like a hard line. I think it's moving towards that because people are literally be being line. starved here. It's crazy, bro. I don't think it's going to be a hard line. I think it's, there's just going to be a lot more people that create. Like Wally. It's going to be like Wally and people think, in the well, chairs. <laughs> I think that the, I think if there is some kind of global uh, sedentary movement. No, if there's like a global uh universal income, universal basic oh, income yeah. kind Sorry. of thing. Universal basic income, yeah. If there's a any if there is a universal basic income that comes to the United States, I think it's only going to allow people to create at a higher level and people will then also be able to consume at a higher level. Because because it's gonna 
this is my hypothesis. Like I said, I'm not a world leader. I don't do financial politics all the time. I'm all not, right. I we're we're just life. young people. I'm speculating. I'm right. pure speculation and pure opinion. For example, if I was getting two thousand dollars right now, I'd be able to pay for my groceries. I would be able to have uh, my own space that I could focus in and create a routine that I didn't have to worry about. Um, I would be able to pay for my gym membership to be healthier, right? I mean, I already pay for a gym membership. It's just that right. would allow me to do that, right? And it would allow me to not have to devote 16 to 30 hours at a job where I'm not actually leveraging as much value as I, f I feel I could, right? Because working at Guitar Center for however many hours I do, for those hours, I give a value that is worth between like 11 and $15 an hour. Right. That's how much value that role at Guitar Center has. As an engineer, as a drummer, as a producer, the value that I give in that area is like is worth like a fifty dollars an hour is worth like a thirty dollars an hour right right so all of a sudden it allows me to spend more time polishing my website which is time that i wouldn't necessarily get paid for all of those like upfront time investments i would have more time to actually do those things i would not have to spend i i would probably be able to spend less hours scanning job sites to look at jobs to to that could basically provide that paycheck that i would be getting right right to spend time on somebody else's thing in order to provide more time to the clients that i'm working with and the companies that i'm building right to in order to have those at a higher quality and get there faster so what you're basically saying is and then it would, you're all, not talking on the flip side it yeah. would allow me to like while I'm doing that, I'd be able to afford higher like as I start to get more income on that, I would be able to afford higher quality things faster because of the fact that I would be getting more higher value contracts through music. I'd be I'd be creating higher value content with the, the people that I'm working with. And of course, I would be getting paid for that sooner. So I'd be, re I would be reaching a higher income sooner because of the fact that I had more freedom in the beginning. Okay, so that's those are really good points. And and here's what I'm what I'm hearing. I think what I'm hearing is instead of universal basic income, what you're trying to say is that this is going to be like a way of changing our perception on what the basic, vital human needs are, because. You're basically assuming that I don't think what you what, what, on the, I want to rephrase it a little because, bit because I don't think it's so much a change on what the actual needs are. It's a change on it's a change on how much energy you have to focus on just basic things. Well, then they could give you credit in that manner. I agree. They could give you credit for like groceries. They could give you credit for uh, healthcare. They could give you credit for whatever. Like they could give you that money in ways that are restricted to the basic human needs because here's my, I, my thinking. I, I with do agree. Yeah. The problem with that is that when that one, oh, my only real problem with that is through that, you are kind of, uh, you kind of dictate. What the money is going to be spent on. And you kind of, need to in order for the government to get something passed like that yeah they would need to come up with a one size fits all kind of approach yeah. which one size doesn't fit all right and that's the pro like i feel like that's the issue with or the reason why a lot of people get upset with a lot of government programs is they feel it may be like one size fits all and even though it works for 80 or 90 percent of the people 
the couple percent that it doesn't work for are very vocal about it. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, when universal health care, like when Medicare Medicaid became a thing. Yeah. So many people got upset. It was like, oh, this is forcing me to do this and uh, it's boosting premiums or whatever it did for those couple of people. But for the huge amount of people that it actually helped and gave health care that didn't have it before. Yeah. They were just like, yeah, no, this is great. But they just no, this the is... people with voices. Yeah, this is you know totally I mean? fine. But I just wanted to say that for me, I think that I think that thinking goes far. But I think at some point you need like I think it's flawed because you're taking you said you're talking about creation, right? And that how would help you create. And I was definitely thinking about that, too. I'd be like, damn, if I just get two grand in my account every month, I'll do whatever I like, make a bit more money on top of that freelancing and slowly build up wealth. Well, the problem is what's going to happen to the jobs that are not as nice and as creative? What is going to happen to the basic jobs like people that are going to need to take care of like cleaning the cities, uh, people that are going to do jobs that are like less desirable? What are those people going to do when they're going to receive two grand checks in their account every month? Like you, the, 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 why, the reason I think the thinking is flawed is that like you're applying why. it to you. Not everybody Here's is like that, you know? And I think that if you're going to give everybody two grand, it's going to hinder competition because I think half the people are going to do nothing and they're just going to get two grand. They're going to realize that they want to do shit afterwards, but at first, everyone's going to take that payout. Not everyone is going to use that money to just support themselves to make something better out of their lives. Most of the people are going to take it as a bailout, you know? But even then, it just it gets put back into the economy, correct? Right, but into what economy? Into consumer economy. It it, it does get put into consumer economy, but then and and by the way, to... I agree with universal healthcare. By the way, I I, I do believe that there yeah. should be some fucking sort of standard to help people. I, I don't get me wrong, and and I'm open to the idea that universal basic income might be a thing that is going to happen, and it's not the yeah. worst or the best thing. I think it will hinder a lot of competition, though. I think that it's going to render a lot of the human population as purely consumer. Like their one characteristic I, is going to be to consume. I want to two things. One, I don't think it'll hinder competition. I, I want to clarify that a little bit because I think if even if some people are allowed to just be consumers, right? Yeah. You're not. That's not hindering the competition. That's Who are you going to get to work at the supermarket? Who the fuck wants to scan shit That's every day when they can get two grand? Well, yeah, but who well, are you going to get to do that? You're not going to get pe- jobs anymore. And then people are worrying wait, wait, the jobs wait, wait, wait. are going to leave. Okay. Wait, no, they're going to leave the job. Jobs are not going to leave the people. The people are going to leave the fucking jobs. You know, like who is, who's going to take care of like sweeping the streets? Which is a very important fucking job. Who's going to want to do that when they get to the grind in their account? Here's two things, though. One, how much value have we put on those jobs? Well, we don't put a lot of value, but it obviously keeps okay, our wait, streets wait, wait, clean. No, 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 stop that, stop there. So we haven't put a lot of value. As, As a human race, no. Everyone's, like, scared no, no, of becoming no, no, a street sweeper, right? Because no, no, our mentality no, no, is like, no, no, oh, I don't want to become that. But it's stupid. Well, why? Why? Why do people it's say stupid? Because... Because we have oh because they they're dirty but I it's stereotype no, 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 it's no, no, stereotypes no. that's why dirty and a lot of people go like oh they don't make any money yeah they don't make any money like it's stupid okay, and some so, of the people that are like working and like like truckers about, but think about this when they make we, bank <laughs> when we think about this when we think about the um when we think about actual uh, what's it called. I, we literally said this word, the name for the type of economy that we're in. Universal basic income. No, 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 no. The type of economy. Like uh, there's communism and there's socialism. Socialism and then there's capitalism. Uh, capitalism. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> I, 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 remember, right. I forget like, the, the, the dumbest words at the dumbest times. All right. So we're in capitalism. So yeah. how does capitalism work? When there's a, there's a need, uh, there's a, uh, there's a market and then there's the value, right? There's yeah. the product market value right right so there's less people that have to do those jobs what happens to the value of the people that are willing to do those jobs or want to do those jobs it's gonna increase it increases okay all of a sudden the person that's only making eleven dollars and 
not a like livable wage. Yeah. Is now making fifteen, twenty dollars an hour because their job is actually valued because the health. That's an interesting point. Yeah. That was paid. That was not being paid a livable wage. That's a that, yeah. That's a now very good point. But how many people are gonna wage. do that? I see most of the people that have a job that pays three grand and a half, they're definitely going to take that pay cut to do nothing. Yeah. No, no, no. But here's the thing. If you're only giving $2,000 a month. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, we're just assuming it's $2,000 a month as well. A lot of, but a lot of times the numbers that have gotten thrown around are like $1,000 a month. Yeah. Or like $2,000 a month. Yeah. How many thousand dollars a year does that equate to? 24 grand a month, 24 grand a year. On the high end. Yeah. On the high end, 12 grand on the low end. Now, what is a typical livable salary? I don't know. Now it's like, what, 11, 12 bucks per hour? Which is like, I don't know, 24, isn't it 24,000? Isn't it 24,000? Isn't it, didn't they say it was two grand just to meet the bare minimum or something like that? No, I think it was, I, I thought it was three. I don't remember. I think three is. I, I, I really don't know. Yes. So what your point is that the amount of money they would give you, it's still not going to be enough money to like. It, yes. Okay. What about. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. But they're not going to need to go to work every day. And I understand that that's going to be good for people yes, like us. And that's good. No, right? no. That's. But. It's, it's good because then even those jobs where it was like there's one person that has to. That's slaving away for 80 hours. Yeah. Now all of a sudden they only have to slave away for 40. Exactly, so the motivation might that, drop. And then there's like somebody else that's like, all right, well, I'll pick up the other 40 hours so I can get that other $24,000. Yeah. So now they're making the same amount of money but spending half of the time, right? And possibly making even more money because potentially the value goes up because there's less people that want to do yeah. it. Yeah. If that were to happen. Now we're at, they have, they're working 40 hours instead of 80 hours. They get to spend time with their kids. So then there's less kids that grow up not having time with their parents. Yeah. We have more parents that can help kids with their homework. We have more parents that can provide groceries for their kids without working 100 hours. Right? We have more money in the economy that can be put towards community programs. We can we have more people that are available to spend time with in the community teaching the things that they're working on. Right. And that's, that's all of these little waterfall things that a lot of people don't think about. We have potentially less crime because less people have to resort to crime in order to get that $2,000 a month. Yeah. And all of these waterfall things, I think is the things that will, as like, it, this is, even if it gets implemented, first of all, it'll take time to get it implemented, first of all. Second of all, once it is implemented, it's going to take time to see the waterfall effects of it. Yeah. Because if you think about it, if it was implemented tomorrow, all those parents that have little kids that they start to spend time with that will now grow up in a healthier household, all yeah. of the people that don't need to stay with spouses that are paying bills, even though they're abusive. Right. That will, the, the major effects of that will only be seen in the next generation. 10 years from then is when you start to see the big trends of that. When right. you start to see the number of healthy people, the, the, uh, the amount of mental health issues that actually get addressed to the lowering rates of, uh the the lowering rates of um people that are not contributing to society do you think they're gonna lower i think it's gonna lower i think like that's an outlook you can have and 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 you brought up incredible points by the way you know i love having a conversation with someone that's on the other side on this podcast when they can actually bring up fucking good points you know not just say hey i look i watch fucking cnn or fox and here's what i think this is so, another thing that we're starting to learn to value, right? Is yeah. The, the, uh, the skill to have a discourse. Exactly. Exactly. And my follow-up question to that, and this is what I ask everybody, and this is usually a question that we I, usually doesn't get answered, and we it's and doesn't it ends in a stalemate. If 
socialism or whatever has worked. I'm not saying universal basic income alone is socialism, but it is definitely a socialist like ideology. Why has it never worked? There's not a single time it has worked. Like there's name no one not a single country that has adopted it and okay has worked so or or has there or maybe I'm wrong you can you like I'm you can prove me wrong too like no, no, no. I don't think I it's don't ever disagree worked. With you. I agree with that. Would you also agree that pure capitalism has also not worked? No, none. It has produced a working nation of people that works like rats for no okay. almost no money. So that's where I go. I feel that out of all of the things that we do between socialism yeah. and uh, capitalism, there's a balance. Right. I think the thing that America is trying to do, it being the experiment that it is, is constantly trying to find this balance of things. Yeah. And I feel like the... I personally feel like we haven't found the balance yet. I don't think I so like, either. I feel like... Because it's right and left only. Yeah. It's extremes, like you know? We started capitalism, and then... um, You know, we've we've corrected multiple times throughout history, right? I think that within our lifetime, there's going to be a large correction. Kind of like you were talking about, we're going to this state of economy. I think there's yeah. going to be a major change within our lifetime of the economy of the United States. In general. If we give people two grand a month, aren't they going to trust the government and whatever they tell you to do more? And they tell you, yeah, go and do this. Well, they give me two grand a month and sustain me and I'm definitely not have to go through the struggles anymore. I'm going to do what they say. Don't you think in a way it's going to do that as well? And I'm sorry to cut your point. I just, it's one of the things like, that's what I'm saying. Has social, has it worked yet? You know, has it worked anywhere? Not even in Nordic countries because everyone says Nordic countries are socialist. Look at their uh, economic system and it's one I of the most capitalistic so- fucking systems ever. I'm cool. Think- and, and I learned this from the Whole Foods CEO and his book, he has a good book on it, but yeah. Yeah. I think socialism will not work. And I think the thing that the United States and a lot of people within the United States, when they talk about universal basic income, yeah, they're not talking about socialism. Yeah, exactly. I think I think it gets branded as socialism because that's a a term. The that term know that has the term. It's, it's a universal basic income. Sounds like oh, everyone's just gonna get money. But when you say universal basic human needs. That's different. It's not even That's that. like, it's oh, like when we so all agree go- that there's certain things that we shouldn't have to fucking worry about, like food, clean water, fucking basic stuff, like a place to live in the fucking greatest country in the world that you're calling it, no? So, oh, we are all agreeing that there's certain things that we all need. Here's the money. You should spend it on them, but we're not going to limit on what you spend it. If you approach it that way, it seems more reasonable, right? Then if you say that, yeah, we're going to give everybody two grand a month. They're like, oh, nobody's going to do shit. It's different, you know? They I just branded it in such a wrong way. <laughs> I think it's that's the branding in general. Like, the, Yeah. And this is a conversation that happens on a lot of podcasts. The Democratic Party specifically is fucking god awful at branding and copywriting. They had so many They're chances to and they just failed. fucking terrible at it. They just like, failed, Just bro. look at... Um, Look at uh, abolish uh, deep on the police, bro. Defund no, police. yeah, that was no, the no. worst. The worst thing they could do, like the naming defund, that thing defund. Defund the police is the dumbest name for it because if you yeah. look at the other side, and this is a right. pod, this is a turn uh, a, a point that I saw brought up on another podcast, which makes a lot of sense. Can't yeah. remember the exact podcast it was. So please forgive me, whoever. That's said okay. It. Um. If you look at the Republican side, what usually do they? What usually happens when they say defund? When Republicans say defund, yeah, what happens? They take money away, and you ninety percent of the time when you hear about Republicans defunding something, yeah, they're removing the funding to a point. Yeah, where from art no programs or whatever the fuck. Yeah, they do every they time. They remove it to a point where it can no longer work without that funding. So yeah. for them, defund actually means to remove all of the funding and just kill the program. Which is why when they hear defund the police, 
they hear abolish the police. That's what it means to them. Because when you say, hey, we're looking to defund these uh, defund these uh, community programs, it means we don't want to spend money on these programs and we don't want them there at all. Leave it up to other people to handle it. So yeah. when you say defund police to those people, it means get rid of the police. But some but of the, the people Democrats, actually believe that. Some of the people actually like, yeah, I take all the fucking money away. <laughs> those are the people that aren't actually like... Yeah, but that's the problem behind defund the police. People believe it. Yeah, because one, there's the what the term was meant to mean. And then yeah. Extreme they meant reallocate the money that's, so we can yes. better use the money yes. and train the police to do what the fuck they're supposed to do. Yeah, so... Let's. I want to. I want to ignore the, the extremes. Yeah, the, the unreasonable the, people. Ten percent over here. Yes. Ten percent over here. Yeah. So let's focus on the eighty percent. Yeah. The um. So yeah. For example, defund. Like it's the stupidest name ever. But if you, when you go to like police departments, when you go to Republicans, it's like, hey, um, if we just allocated a little bit of the police funding to um, having a social worker go with them who is trained in psychology and sociology to go and handle some of these men- mental health cases, is that something you'd agree with? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds pretty yeah. cool. Uh, would you, uh, um, do you think it'd be cool to uh, have some uh, community programs that, like, you know, help with education so people don't, aren't committing crimes so much? Yeah. yeah That's so even better. Get us, get us some more books. I think they could handle some more books. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Um, all right. Do you think it'd be cool to have, uh, you know, some community-run programs that help with policing the community and just having people, um, you know, do their own thing and have people that look like them policing their own communities. You know, that's not a bad idea. That's That yeah. sounds like a pretty cool thing. And most Republicans, most police departments especially, agree with a lot of the points that some people that say deep on the police actually want. Yeah. Right? They don't want to go and handle mental health cases, they signed up to go stop bad guys. That's that's their thing. They're like, I want to. They want to go stop bad guys. They want to be detectives. They want to do stuff. It's like it's the same kind of thing. You you don't need a chainsaw to cut the lawn. <laughs> it's not. It was not done. It's not bad marketing. I think, in my opinion, and not to start anything like you. You don't just by mistake throw around a term that's gonna fucking trigger you know everybody let's be accurate it's not bad marketing they were marketing to the wrong people they're marketing to the wrong people they're like yeah it was yeah. just it was poor they choosing were marketing and... to the 10 percent that'll help them be louder rather than the 40 percent that's actually going to help them get the things exactly done. and i like the thing that you said before you said let's ignore the 10 percent on the on the extreme right 10 percent extreme left and i think that the majority of people think that what we see in the news and the people uh, breaking in the capital and like it was fucking Fortnite and all that is everybody or the people that are out riding and breaking into thing, small play, in this... breaking into small businesses right which they were doing in yeah. summer it means that everybody who believes that is like that and the fucking truth is the big majority in the middle if we were to fucking sit down I always say this at a table with a fucking beer or whatever if you don't drink tea yeah. and sit down over and and talk like we do or yeah. t- talk to the other person and say okay what are what do we agree on first you're going to find out you agree on most things with the people and two you're going to find out most people are not in the extremes yeah. and the extremes and are represented the other- by the media to get you know attention money ads power whatever you want to say and i'm more, i'm in the advertising so i know no, no. shit you're getting where i'm you're getting exactly where i was going to go which is the media um outrage is profitable for the media period yeah, and the ten percent on the left and the ten percent on the right are the people who get the most outraged and pay the most money to hear themselves verified, right? They hear yeah. their ideas by somebody else, and th- they just pay the most money. So they're like, "All right, well, like this is how we get money, and this is how we get the big paycheck. So like, let's do yeah. this." Uh, and that's just, uh, I feel like. I think it was uh, Hassan Minaj broke down like the the of uh, the the macro effects of the two party system and how that has bled into so many of the things that we in see in the Patriot the Act, right? Yeah, Patriot Act. Yeah, he broke down some of the the larger effects of having a two party system and what's wrong with that, right? And I agree with him that I feel a lot of the issues that we're seeing now 
is a byproduct of having a two-party system. And I think, I do feel that the the highest value that would be brought to the United States would be if we were to bring in a, th- a third party. I, I feel like if we were to have a, the, the point at which we get a third party, right. we're going to see a, a few things mellow out. We're going to see um, a lot more, a, ba- a lot bigger balance in terms of how uh, the kind of laws and legislation gets shifted and gets attention. We're going to see a huge balance in popular media. And I think that now is a great time for a third party to pop up. Yeah. And I think it could happen now. I think now is an opportunity for a third party to pop up because there are a lot of Republicans that are upset with the GOP. Yeah. Are a lot of conservatives that are upset with how the GOP has handled things. Uh, there are a lot of centrist Democrats that are like, eh, all of that over here, I'm not sure that I quite agree with it. Um, I put it very raw. Yeah. I say that it's people that like guns and weed. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. It's uh, people that are like, holy shit, who do I vote for, dude? I don't know. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I mean, yeah. look, I just want, like, I want to be able to shoot, but I want background. But, but I want to smoke. To, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's simple things like that where it's like, look, I like uh, guns. I like shoot. Like, I used to be an Olympic target shooter. Damn. It's, it's nice to shoot. It's Everyone, dope. Like, yeah, I I'm, under, trying, I'm trying to get a license and stuff. Yeah. I understand that it's fun to go shooting. It's fun to go yeah. shoot some targets. It's fun to go skeet shooting and shoot some clays. It's just fun to do that stuff. Yeah. And also, it's nice to have something within your house to protect yourself with. I, I don't rape now, but I can see as when I'm eventually in my own place as an adult that that is something that I would do, right? Yeah. But I think there Definitely. should be background checks and research on firearms. Right, like it's just right. basic shit. Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, like, drugs is like, yeah, I'd like to try some stuff. Like, I don't mind. Right. I, I wouldn't mind being able to, like, eat edibles and my home or like out in public right without having to worry that you're gonna get fucking thrown in jail or you know find that, whatever money for it or like not having to worry about getting a back like if i could show up and do my job and like exactly having a record on the weekends and, and not having to worry about a drug test that's test. like even though i'm operable operable it's like yeah there are alcoholics that are less wait Okay, we're going to start a a thing that we're going to dive into. I I, I sense it. We're going to dive into this thing, and I love it. Bro, I got to piss, like, so bad. Okay, let's take a break. Let's take a break, let's piss, and we'll come back, okay? Okay, I'm totally done. Great. (laughs) All right, we're back. Bro, it was was so bad. I was like, there's no way I'm breaking this conversation (laughs) as well. It was so good. I was like, I cannot do it for the content. (laughs) No, it was funny. You read my fucking mind because I was like, I got to – I also really had to piss. Yeah, no, it was it was bad. As soon as you said that, I was like, perfect. <laughs> it's 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 great. It's great, bro. Also, just to just so it makes it easier to edit. Yes, it's like thank you. Podcast part two. Thanks, dude. Um, so tell me, we were talking about we were about to get into like uh being able to consume an edible or two and not having to go back to work and have to worry yeah. that you're going to fill a drug test. Although, you can get hammered on a bottle of Jack Daniels, show up to work next day, and have no consequences for it. What's that? And destroy you, your liver. Yeah. Technically, well, like, you would get in trouble if you came and, like, it was impacting If you're drunk. Your yeah, if you're drunk, but you cannot test that you drank yesterday. Yeah, but if it's not <laughs> impacting your work, then it's like, all right, cool. Right. No, I'm, I'm saying it, but like, I'm while they're limiting, like edible use they're allowing abnormal and obnoxious use of alcohol right yeah it's crazy and it also it does detract from work because then it since alcohol is addictive like alcohol is more damaging yes yes in general like personally there's downsides to both like everything you know i'll be honest i have never tried anything weed related ever and most of it has been because it's like i just I goody too. She's not wanting to break the law, kind of thing. Even though, I dude, I know. I grew up as a. I was a student athlete all my life, dude, up until pff, second year of college. Yeah, and then I was like, 
never, yeah. never touched. And then until, you know, you, yeah, you college, open up college, to the world. College things happen. You learn um, the world is different than they told you when you're a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, and that's... I think... This is just a personal view. I feel like the closer we can get to the thing that we're telling our kids, uh, the closer that thing that we're telling our kids about the world, the closer it can be to the actual world, the better off your kids will be. Yeah, I, I, that's a very valuable point. Don't paint a picture for them. That's well, but the, the, that's not accurate. But that's the problem. Most people thought and we're about to go back to government i hate it because i know it most people saw weed as a bad thing and psychedelics as well because of the because of the drug act because of the uh, i don't remember what it was like i think it was nixon right the propaganda and they it was, no the, or reagan which one who was it? i don't remember who passed it yeah, but I forget the exactly war on drugs it was. yeah it was the war on drugs i'm pretty sure it was nixon and it was they they made bro they made a drug that allows you to just whatever relax calm down ease pain uh decrease anxiety if if we can get a little like this isn't super technical but it was less a war on drugs and more war on mexicans well that or weed and specifically was a war on you could argue a lot because the crack i think i i also personally think it was the crack epidemic was what it wasn't it targeting african-american communities Right. I think there's many, you can argue that this war on drugs honestly attacked so many different things, including, and the lesser talked part, the, the hippie, so-called hippie movement, which was the like enlightenment movement, another enlightenment movement, right? We could have argued. Yeah. It was just about a bunch of people taking acid and, and shrooms and smoking yeah. pot and then realizing that, hey, we shouldn't send people to war and hey, we shouldn't do that. And then they're like, oh, fuck, people are taking these drugs and starting to talk shit that we don't like. We're gonna make psychedelics a number, a uh, 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 schedule one yeah. drug. They're putting it as the same height as heroin. Yeah. Which, by the way, is legal, and they're selling it through pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck are we talking about? Yeah, it's there's a lot of. Well, how was it the war on Mexicans though? Because I want to learn about that, uh, and I'm sorry to have stopped there, you. I, no, I want to learn, you know. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what you were saying made a lot of sense, and. You're totally cool to interject at that point. Um, from my understanding, and I, I forget exactly what it was that I watched. It, there was a documentary and also a discussion on a podcast somewhere. Oh, I think it was a discussion on a podcast that pointed me to a documentary video. Um, but a ba- basically, through the pop- propaganda, it yeah. would attach the drugs to Mexico. Like they would attach it to people of Latin American descent, right? Well, so, that's where most of the weed was coming from. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and then it was basically attaching things that yeah. they didn't control, and that uh, even there are people within their own societies, th- people that the what they're doing is bad. Was, weed is yeah. bad. Weed and yeah. cocaine was the same thing for everybody at that point because that's what was coming yeah. in. Yeah. And I forget it. There was a, there was another reason. There was another reason why they uh, that a lot of people have said that was behind the the war on drugs, right? Um, specifically yeah. on weed being illegal across the country. There was another reason. I can't remember it. I got to go back and educate myself a little bit more. The ones that I know that I'm aware of, and the ones that make sense the most to me, is one, the the pharmaceutical companies. So. The yeah. amount of stuff, and I'm not saying like, okay, you smoke weed and all your fucking health problems are solved. No, that's not how it works. It's, dude, when you're in pain and you're recovering from, a, a, I don't know, kidney stone, let's say, and instead of taking the opioids that they give you, you can recur to um, edibles or smoking or whatever you want, which is, yes, it's not as potent as a, I'm not telling you if you broke your fucking spine or some shit like that, change it out. No, but for the yeah. common injury you don't need to prescribe fucking opioids and get people addicted how many fucking people are addicted to opioids and where's the fucking war on that you know not the government the people are doing the war so you know there's a lot of bad drugs and that we could switch from from the pharmaceutical companies to weed i think what's gonna happen and because they're starting to legalize it everywhere and it's gonna be legal everywhere soon is 
pharmaceutical companies are going to start making weed 100 percent pharmaceutical companies have as much have all the money they want yeah they have huge money watch pharmaceutical companies are going to start creating cannabis products because they have hey, the money to invest they have hey, the money to raise harvest grow they're just going to join the competition they're not going to lose gonna, i'm going to point this point out uh and you may have heard of this before but one of the biggest debates right now is as weed becomes illegal is how do you make it how do you keep the industry equitable right what do you mean because for example because in some places it's so hard to get permits how do you make sure they're not favoring right buys it's gonna have to be a federal how law you, honestly and that's it's a, a thing that i've seen on a couple of shows come up already it's like all right uh, how do you make it an equitable industry for people that want to just get started in marijuana hundred fifty thousand dollars to start in illinois or yeah. or something like that it's yeah. fucking crazy and it's exactly. legal i think it's almost cheaper to start in places that it's not like illinois and that it's yeah. only legal for for medical purposes than it is here you cannot do that so they're definitely gonna have to like drop that yeah and there's a lot of things like that that um there was a discussion with this uh, an African American founder uh, of a, like a it was a black owned weed dispensary, and they were having okay. a discussion about it, uh, literally about that exact thing. It was like, look, I want to do it, but it's like it's so hard to do it that the fact that we're the only black owned marijuana dispensary in whatever state they were in isn't surprising. Yep. And it's like trying to make it equitable so it doesn't turn into another industry that's just perpetuating the wealth gap, that it can be an industry that can maybe serve as somewhat of an equalizer that can bring, that can add, uh, that can add wealth to people that are passionate about it, but didn't have the funds before. Yeah. Um, well, and not I also just think continue to add wealth to the people that already have wealth. That are already making more money. Right. Yeah. But I also think that. That that is a danger, but I think where that can be reduced a little bit is when you look at the whole supply chain and every single job and market that weed is gonna create, and I mean cannabis yeah. is gonna create. Just I, when I say weed, it's like street, you know, like cannabis in general, because cannabis includes you know CBD, kratom, it includes a variety yeah. of things. So it's about you know there's gonna have to be people that are gonna be employed to be to work on farms or or like on 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 like weed like uh, on on cannabis farms and. There's going to be people who are going to have to be transporting that. There's going to be people who have to test it. There's going to be a lot of jobs are created along the way. And a lot of businesses are going to have to be created along the way. Like, hey, we will do like this for the cannabis industry. Or we will help dispensers do that. And then it's going to create a lot of business. But like you said, when it comes down to it, the majority yeah. of the profit in the business is going to have to be, you know, an opportunity that everyone can get to, you know? Yeah. Making sure that all the time, you know, the standard and the quality of it is correct. But it shouldn't be different than starting a fucking energy bar box, yeah. like boxed energy bar. You know, FDA yeah. that has to approve it or whatever. And that's and it, bro. Like, let's just think about something that's hilarious, but also really fucked up at the same time. If somebody was arrested for marijuana charges five years ago, then for a lot of the permits to sell marijuana, they wouldn't qualify. Yep. Which is hilarious because the people, it's yep. like telling the people that have been audio engineers before audio engineering was cool and legal. Yeah. That, All right. Now audio engineering is illegal. And, uh, uh, but you, you're actually good at audio engineering. So, like, you're, but we don't need you because, you know, you did it before we, said yeah, you did it before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you did it before we, we said, oh it was my okay. God. So, like, nah, you, we're going to let these people do it because they've never done it before. Yeah, I was arguing like you cannot reach like I was talking about retroactively like letting people go to prison. That's more difficult to do, but like not being able to fucking start or apply for a cannabis license because you committed a crime that's not a crime anymore is okay. Yeah. The basic is if you committed this crime, it means you can commit another crime, right? That's this just justice system. Yeah. It's work like that. But the justice system should also say, okay, we don't consider this a crime anymore. I don't know. You shouldn't. You should be able to do that. You know. Like, I personally feel that if something is not considered a crime anymore, it should be expunged from people's records. Yeah. Like 
if somebody was drinking in the 1920s, right, and that was considered a federal crime, yeah, like, and they're like going to apply for something now, no one's gonna be like, oh, well, you know, you drank right. during prohibition, like that's not cool, man. <laughs> it's the same, it's, it's, it's crazy. Essentially, the same thing. It's just prohibition was for marijuana was a lot longer. <laughs> I just think that there's both sides to it as well. Like, there's a bunch of people yeah. who love to believe that we can solve everything and dude no it's like you gotta make it you cannot like rely on one single thing but i at the same point i said like i know so many people that are like 40s 50s 60s and they're like still working and i know that instead of being able to like relax and come down and sleep or do it because they just want to do it because they can fucking earn it recreational use you know we don't have to use cannabis just because it's medical use bro if some people want if you want to use it for recreational purposes just like having a good beer or whatever do it i think so i'm seeing so many people doing that the delivery things that have started popping up with those like soccer moms ordering marijuana on delivery. yes <laughs> soccer moms uh and and all and retired people are the two biggest market that are growing right now in, you in know the cannabis industry. Me of? you ever watched like the old uh you ever watched like mad men yes you know course. when they're talking about marketing cigarettes or like alcohol to yes. women in that yes. show, how they're like, "Yeah, man, we just gotta get them." Is like it's a thing for them to relax. I feel like now is that for marijuana. Exactly. It's just <laughs> and it's in, it's cycles. You know, every hundred years or every yeah. some like we just introduce something else. You know, and yeah. this time it's fucking weed. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm hoping it's um, I'm hoping it's looking good because if anything, just bro. It, another crime that's not really a crime it's a fucking yeah. plant like oh so one plant i can put in my water and brew and it's tea or there's caffeine that makes me fucking like jittery if i drink too much of it yeah but you know the weed plant that grows out of it's a fucking weed like you don't even like it's it grows by itself it's a wild well you know in most majorities of cases it grows by itself it's just um again we were talking about why is this, why do people still see it like this and why do people yeah. Why are we raised uh, in with a standard that is not what real world is? Because you said I would teach yeah. my kids what you know closest thing to reality is. Well, yeah. because they were our parents and, and whoever it is, they also didn't know because they were also fed some yeah. fucking media. And shit. the other biggest thing is like there are so many people that just stay in their bubble their entire life. Right, now- because. It's, you know, after fucking 60 years of life or 50 years of life, why would you change your entire, like, belief system? And it's system? crazy because now, in this current state of the world, right, there is a greater access to information. There is, means, yeah. Which means two things. One, and it's gone both ways, where one, you, it's, you can have a better picture of the world like so many people before us never had access to. Like, if you right. live in the middle of, like, I don't know, iowa there was no way to know what was actually going on in the world for the most part you just had to wait for yeah. the paper to come out and if hope that there was a reporter that got the information to the person that's running the paper in iowa but most of the time it's like local news now you can know what's going around like the entire world you can learn about all of these different thoughts and different perspectives from the entire world of humanity on the internet the other side is you can also just stay deeper in your bubble. So instead of occasionally, like you can live in New York and not see, you live in a completely different world than the person that lives next door to you. Yeah. I think it's because of an informational overload. It's no, it's because one, it can, it's addicting to have self verification. Yep. And that's what people profit of. Like that's a lot of the divisive media. They profit over telling people that they're right and that the other side is wrong. And creating a boogie. Right. At the other side, in general, the person like us, we prosper the most by knowing the most about the actual state of the world. Yeah. And there's there's just the combatant between that. And it's literally I, I personally feel that most of the people that stay within their bubble it's out of ignorance, not because of choice. Yeah, in the world of information, most people choose to live in not most people. People choose to live in ignorance. Yeah. And, and I don't I was no, thinking I that I personally you know? feel that it's not a choice. I feel like it's literally not knowing better. It's, it's like an unconscious choice. 
Yeah, I, I feel think... like it's it. It's almost like your dog pissing on the couch. Like he doesn't like the first time he does it, he has no idea that it's a bad yeah. thing to do. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I just think people's belief systems and the fact that hey, you're told that you you're being told every day what to do and. Like you said, back then you had to wait for the newspaper to find out what was going on in the world. And you so were you, given if you had empty to change, space. Right. And you're giving empty space for you to adapt that new change, right? Like, this is a new thing that we're going to do. And it was also a slower pace, right? It wasn't like, yeah. hey, in 2010, we had an iPod. Now we're about to go to Mars. You know, like it's, yeah. it was not like that. It was like slower so people could adapt to change. What happened is yeah. the speed of change and the speed of information fucking zoomed. We got blown with all this information and some to the people point where, adapted. yes, yeah, some, some people, people adapted and knew how to filter the information. But most people remember when we were talking like years ago when we were realizing that social media was giving us all this news and information. That like, oh, information overload was being no. thrown around. We've already passed that. And people all of that? don't look because they, they the people only look at one source because they don't want to fucking look at everything because they're being blown with messages all over the place. And all that's that? why. Look at the generation that didn't grow up with social media. They're the people that haven't learned how to... They just don't understand yeah. the downsides of social media. So they don't talk about it. They don't. They haven't told the kids. But like our generation, growing up with social media, a lot of us have learned the downsides of social media. We've learned right. that it can become a time suck. We've learned that you need to control and research what you're seeing. But the people who... Uh, there's so many people that just never learned that and didn't grow up with something like social media. And all of a sudden they're, they're used to just listening to whatever people were saying at the bar. And like, if somebody was there that would check them, there would be somebody there to check them, but you can go on Twitter and just hear like positive responses the entire time. Yeah. Um, and it can get all of a sudden, all of the systems that they grew up using to get all of their information. Boy. Or they're being taken out of context. It's going to a different platform and applying the rules from the old one. Which is the kind of the conversation that I have about Clubhouse with a lot of people. It's like right. people have these preconceived notions of all of the social media, like Twitter and Instagram, where there's verification badges and follower counts are the economy. And then they come to a Clubhouse and set up follow for follow rooms because they think, Tell That's me more. Gonna... Yeah, I, I want to tell. I just set up my new description. I wrote a nice description today. In yeah. My pro, my bio. Tell me more, like about Clubhouse, because I just listened yeah. to it. Like it's one of example of where it was like, oh, there's this new social. There's this new whole fucking movement. It's like this new YouTube. You know, yeah. it's ten years ago. It'd been like, holy shit. There's this yeah. big new thing. You a know, a lot of people have been comparing it to like early days of Facebook or the early yeah. days of YouTube or the early so, days of Twitter. What is Clubhouse for the people that don't know? Yeah. So for the people that don't know, chat Clubhouse is like. Uh, an app based around chat rooms. So uh, there's the re going along the it being called Clubhouse. There's like a hallway that you would walk down. Think of if you were at a conference, and there's all of these rooms having different discussions. The hallway, which is I guess the most equivalent thing to a feed, right? From other social media apps, it's not the same, but that's the closest parallel to it. In your feed it's called the hallway and it would be like you're walking down the hallway and you can see all of these different rooms with the titles yeah and when you go into those rooms there's people having a conversation on the stage which is all of the people that are talking then there's an audience so the people that are just listening and you can treat it like radio where you're just tuning into different rooms that are talking about topics or treat it like a podcast where you're just tuning into conversations around topics and just put it on the background and listen or you can also hold your own kind of rooms, have conversations with people that you know or people that you don't know, have public rooms for random people to jump into, have social rooms for people that you follow and want to have conversations to be able to see your room jump in. Or you could have private rooms where you invite and ping in like five people that you want really want to talk to and just have a little conversation. And you can follow people to see more of the conversations that they're jumping into. And... Uh, especially in the beginning since it is invite only there were a lot there was a lot of value on the platform because there were a lot of it basically started with important people and important people would only invite other important people yeah um when i jumped on the first week of november their estimate is around like thirty thousand people wow the first week of november so when i went on clubhouse and think about 
in general, the rule is 80, 20, 20 percent of the audience is going to is going to provide 80 percent of the topics in the engagement. That's across yeah. any platform. Same thing on yeah. Twitter, same thing on Instagram. 20 percent of the people are going to present going to provide 80 percent at the of job, the too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything. Um, and on Clubhouse back on the first week of November, 20 percent of 30,000 was like six right it's like six and six hundred people wow yeah so that was like 600 people that's less people than some people have in their high school graduating class wow so i basically saw all the same people all the time and it was like i knew saw a lot of familiar faces and it was really easy to build relationships and it was really it was really awesome and a lot of people were there was a sense of trust because of the fact that it was invite only Everybody felt like everybody on Clubhouse was somebody that somebody felt was important. Yeah. So there was a sense of trust that whenever you were having a conversation, one, you could trust them to be an intelligent person and have an actual conversation with them. And two, you trust that if you gave value to them, there was a way that most people could give value back to you. Okay. So there was a lot of bartering of Really, yeah. there, there was a lot of hey, I'm gonna give you this this information because I know 30 minutes from now when I go in somebody else's room, I'm gonna get just as much information as I gave. Yeah, I saw some millionaire dude today. Like I saw, I checked his profile out and everything. He built like 30 businesses, invested in like early investor in Uber, whatever. This dude was answering questions like, hey, I'm starting my startup, I'm doing my business, and I don't really know how to like progress every day. You know, I don't know how to keep myself on track. This dude broke it down, like do the one goal. Like what's your one goal for the business? Get consumers. Okay. Every single morning, do the one goal that's going to get you closest. And then he's like to getting consumers. And he started like breaking down shit. I was like, bro, and this that is was for like today, fucking right? free. Yeah. You know, I entered for a month, two ago, minutes, a month ago, those conversations that are now like maybe yeah. a couple minutes each, it would be one person talking to one person for like 30 minutes. Wow. Like I'm one not on even one. joking. It was literally one on one. Like, Artists would have whole conversations with managers. Uh, it was it. I remember I jumped into a room, my first day on Clubhouse. There was some kind of entertainment lawyer conference happening. All of these lawyers were in one room on Clubhouse, and they're all just talking about entertainment lawyer stuff. And yeah. then they start. Wow. And people were just asking questions. And all of these entertainment lawyers were just like, yeah, this, this, this. They were just spewing information. Wow. It, it was like, it was great. It was literally like just sitting in a room with a bunch of lawyers and just. Well, thinking about it, it's smart. You're like, you're on Clubhouse and you got some into some legal trouble. I'm not saying that that's what they were doing, but you know, there's yeah. a lawyer group or it's also going to no, be smart for people who are going to, who's going to need help. Or services is gonna become a way where people can be connected exactly to people what it was in like, whatever way they want. You that's know, literally what was happening. It was like, all right, I'm gonna give this information, and then people would follow up afterwards, and then for a lot of people, it transferred to clients outside of the app. It like a lead magnet. Rela- it can be a lead it magnet. Transferred you know? to relationships with people outside of the app that were profitable for both people. Yeah. And now you. S- and it's now you can still find that it's rarer because there's so much more fluff and so many more consumers on the app. Right. But now in order for you to get, get a following and stuff, the quality of it has to be bigger because the quality of it has to increase because now like, okay, you're going to get exposure, but unless you like providing like either good questions or good insights or good talking, like you're not, and they're not going to follow you. So it's like a less no, no, of a no, no, bullshit. No, 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 not even that scratch that whole really thing because that part just getting people to follow you when you think of the bartering system if you're just getting people oh i'm, I'm not looking at no, like no, no, people no, no, following let me, me let but me finish, like let me finish, let me finish. yeah so if you're looking at just getting people to follow right before every you could kind of trust that everybody that followed you could give you value yeah now because there's so many more consumers if some that like you can have a large following but most of the following is consumer yeah and you're just you're getting attention for being somebody who provides information information but yeah you're not you you could be doing that all day without getting into the rooms with the other people that can provide value and having large really meaningful conversations 
Right. And that's another thing that I've started to see is a lot of people that were having really meaningful conversations have started to break off and start holding their own rooms instead of all congregating in one major room every day. Yeah. Which it's, is, I think is, it's, I, I, I hope that, you know, there's come back to some core rooms, but also at the same time, so a lot of those core rooms that are happening, they're just private and social now. Yeah. That happens a lot. Where 90% of the people on Clubhouse will never see the rooms with the most value. Damn. Yeah. But, like, if you are somebody who is a professional on Clubhouse and you know and you have a network outside of Clubhouse, like, Clubhouse is the perfect place to continue to, A, build relationships, and you can do a lot of good on Clubhouse. So, yeah, you and, just can't and, approach and so it. You just can't approach I feel like in order to get the most value out of Clubhouse, especially right now, you need to approach it not like a consumer. Like, that conversation that we were talking about all the way at the beginning, where it was, like, yeah. one day consume and the other day produce and see what yeah. the difference is. Yeah. That's a conversation that I've had to have with myself a lot, which is like, all right, between the times that I'm hopping on Clubhouse, how many of these times am I hopping on to actually hold a room or be a moderator in a room and be part of the conversation versus just hopping on, just taking in information for the sake of taking information? Yeah. And I had a, I actually had a conversation with myself like two days ago where I was like, all right, I need to – like. At least 75, 80% of the time I hop on Clubhouse needs to be, I'm contributing to conversations. I'm being a moderator. I'm trying to contribute to the Clubhouse community. I'm not yeah. just taking. Right. I think that's very interesting. And you got us into it in the museum meeting and then I signed up for it and I kind of left it for a few days. Today Bro, in the morning, so I took my iPad excited out. excited for when we start holding museum things. Dude, it's going to be crazy and we're going to be able to do so many things and with it. Like there's so much value that we can offer. Not even that. These conversations, this conversation that we're having yeah. right now, me and you, we can do this on Clubhouse. Like, Yeah, week. that I was going to say, podcasting people, podcasting people, bro, if you're smart, and, no, bro, get on that shit. Best, like me and you should definitely start having more Clubhouse rooms and just having conversations. Yes. I, I enjoy. Bro, I think this is the rooms. longest fucking podcast I've had so far without, I don't know. We're still one hour forty three. We're going no, strong, bro. Well, it was one of the crazy. longest ones. <laughs> um, I highly, I really hope that we do these conversations on Clubhouse. Yeah. Right. Because of the fact that I enjoy hosting rooms on Clubhouse. I love them. Dude, I love I it. I want to learn. You know, like the dynamics of it a bit better. I find it difficult. It is extremely difficult to to hop in and start a room on Clubhouse without at least one other person. Okay. It is ex like if you just pop into a room and you don't have at least have like one person to like start the topic with, yeah. you'll just sit there by yourself and people will hop in. And it's like hey, and then they'll dip out. But if you have at least one person in there that like like me and you, we're like this going back and forth that we've been doing for an hour and forty three minutes. Yeah, we can start doing a clubhouse, and then people will join the conversation because oh they're having a good conversation, right? You know they're vibing and whatnot. And then it's pretty cool. all of a sudden we pull more people into the conversation and people who vibe with the energy raise their hand to come speak on the stage. And then before you know it, we have nine people on the stage having a great conversation. And even if there's not a whole bunch of people in the audience, we still had a great conversation between nine people. And sometimes they should... if you... Sorry, go so... ahead. Yeah. Sometimes if you're having a great conversation with nine people, it turns into like a huge room with like a hundred people in the room just having a conversation, right? Do you think they're going to open it up to more people? Like each room, like increase the size or make a separate room or instead of calling it a room, they can call it an amphitheater. And when there you can do no, a thousand be, people. So it's something like that be called a room and you can have a, the cap on room membership, right? Now, like how many people you can have in one room is around 5,000 now okay. only because of the fact that that's because it's still like a beta app. Okay. And they've realized that when it starts getting more than 5,000, is when they start having problems with infrastructure and being able to support them. Okay. Hardware. They're yeah. going to boost it soon, obviously. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That was my thing because I saw like there was a – some had 2,000. Some was like, okay, so there's not many followers that can be in there for now, you know? But yeah. it's cool. But now Dude, it's at like a 1 million people in Clubhouse. I was going to ask you, for people that are already on there, how would you go about becoming more engaged into these conversations? Because sometimes you can join groups and you – you can raise your hand or whatever. Like, how how do you get to become a, a moderator? 
on some of these groups? Well, one, if you want to become a moderator, host rooms, your own room. Sorry. Host rooms, sorry. Host your own room. That's one. Okay. If you want to become a moderator, host your own room. Um, and then two, if you want to get involved in clubs, well, at the clubs, wait for when they're having questions and ask good questions. Like when you when you get to talk in rooms that aren't your own, contribute to the conversation. Okay. First. Make the first thing that comes out of your mouth be contributing to the conversation, not plugging yourself. Yeah, I no, of course. You if the first thing that comes out of your mouth when you are given the floor to speak is a plug of yourself. Oh, yeah. Hey, by, by the way, I can help you with that. <laughs> people will ignore every word after that. Like yeah. if you if you were like general like legitimately go if someone goes hey I'm looking for somebody to just help me with marketing to build a brand for my EP and then you go hey uh, DM me I'll help you that's a different story but yeah. if someone goes hey we're running a room for like music for artists and like hey uh, Vlad what's it what what do you do you have a question do you have a comment do you want to add to the conversation and like especially if there was a conversation going on like the first thing on your mouth is hey yeah my name's Vlad I work for Museamp, I do marketing and blah, blah, blah. And you go on like a 15 second rant about just what you do. And then you go, yeah, and then I would love to offer any services that I do to anybody in here. And then, uh, oh yeah, the one thing that I wanted to add to the conversation was. Yeah. That like, um, doesn't start on the good foot. <laughs> people's like, all right, why didn't you just say the one thing you did want in the conversation? Because when people will actually listen to what you have to say is when they ask you for it. Yeah. So the second yeah. they go, hey, Vlad, you know, that was a really insightful question you asked. Did you want to talk about, like, what do you do that, you know, you thought of this sexy question or what do you do that you're interested in this topic? I was like, oh, yeah, I'm interested in marketing because I went to school for it and I work in my own startup right now that's doing it. Like, oh, you work in a startup? What's your startup? And all of a sudden they're like, you're a cool person. I want to know what you do instead of, yeah. oh, this guy's plugging himself. I just want him to contribute to the conversation. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's a valid point. So I think what this platform is going to be, be able to offer is a sense of authenticity or yeah. the currency on it, better said. And it's going to it's gonna be authenticity, sorry. It's going to reintroduce the skill of conversation. <laughs> oh, thank fucking God. And, do, bro, why do you think I started this podcast, man? Because I was going fucking crazy. I couldn't have it's conversation so with anybody. To have, like, it, it, it's, difficult. it's crazy, bro. And at school, it was nice because when I was in school and I was doing a Where's the Time Gone, which is a podcast that I ran for a while. Yeah. And I've since passed down to uh, one of my friends who's still at the school that I was going to. Where's the Time Gone was meant to be a conversation between student leaders on, uh, especially like upperclassmen and things like, you know, they learned in school the conversations that an underclassman and all the questions that underclassmen want to ask of the upperclassmen. But, yeah, you know, especially these upperclassmen, like, they're busy. They're presidents of clubs or they're presidents sometimes of multiple right. clubs or they're a president of a club and they're also helping at the school or they're pre or they're working a co-op while also in school like they're doing a whole bunch of shit and often the people that can provide the most value are the people that have the least time to provide the value yeah right so that was why i wanted to have that podcast to be somewhere that i could record conversations around the common questions like all right how do you fit in fitness around you know your busy school schedule how do you stay healthy all right well uh, say looking at this cafeteria food what do you suggest in order to, to stay healthy on campus things yeah as simple as that and all the way up to all right how do you balance being a president of a club homework and then like actually looking to past college how do you balance like in college success and like looking past college yeah all of these conversations were conversations that i would get asked myself as a student leader and I was like, look, I don't have all day to sit here and talk to you about Yeah, this. to answer to everybody the yeah. same question. Yeah, and if yeah. I could just record it once, right. and I could, like, I always had something that even if I couldn't, like, I would love to have a conversation with you, but if I don't have the time, hey, go listen to this podcast. I can't sit here and, like, have coffee with you right now, but I, I talked about it with Maria. She was the president of the Stute, and that was great. Go listen to this podcast, right, yeah. uh, where we talked about it. If at least having that to point people towards for me was something that I really wanted to do. And it was difficult because first of all, I knew most of the people that I knew at the school wouldn't be able to be on the podcast because they just wouldn't be able to contribute to it. And yeah. then the people that were that, that I knew that I wanted to have on and that would contribute. I, I, I saw two things happen. 
one, some people were really busy and it was just difficult to schedule. And then there were a lot of people that grew up in a household where they were like, like they're just conditioned to be quiet and yeah. be, yeah. they were conditioned to be quiet and they were conditioned to be, to fit in their box and not to disturb anything outside of their box. So I was like, Hey, can I would love to have you on this podcast and have conversations. They were like, Oh, like, no, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. That's a little too, I don't, I don't want to. Try right. getting people on a podcast called whatever the fuck this is. <laughs> yeah, it's just. No, I get you. Yeah, not a lot of people are down to to have a so like meaningful balance, conversation. Yeah, and it's and sometimes it's not even that. It's like something as simple as all right, I give you a comment now, or I ask you a question, and then I hand it to you to, you to respond, and when the other person goes, yes, no. Or says one sentence that serves as almost a dead end of the conversation. Like we've done really well because I say something, yeah, and, I, and then it tosses back to you, and then you say something. You add a whole thought, and a exactly. lot of times you also transfer back the conversation. But also, we're both not scared to go. Yeah. Hey, I have an idea. Let me yeah, exactly. This right here. <laughs> exactly, like, exactly. Because I'm like, dude, I want to hear that shit. Because like you've been spewing so much shit that I can I value it, and I'm like. Wait, I have school shit, but I can get his school shit too. So let's let's hear, you know, let's listen yeah, what he has to say. And like that whole there you need to listen, right? Yeah. You need to listen and not listen to respond. Which yeah. is something that we've done. But a lot of people I'm not as good as that. I have to admit, I'm not as good. I, I'm still learning no, no, how no. to Here's the thing. fully you listen don't... to somebody, you know, not just to like listen and argue against what they but have to say. You're already like a a a big step there where it's like you actively listen and you'll be like well you said this and i want to like clarify a little bit on that or i want to build on top of that or i'm just I curious dissect what you're talking about yeah instead of just like i have an idea and i'm just gonna wait until they finish and find a way to just be weave like my shit and, in yeah i just want to yeah. weave my shit in right there's a difference between that and like actually actively listening i hate the fact that my so this is going to be a side note. I hate the fact that my camera keeps adjusting the light. Oh, don't Cause worry. Because like, of the lighting above and because of the distance. Yeah, no, yeah. no. Because, like, right now, it's, like, no. Like, right now, it's, like, really warm. Yeah. <laughs> now it's cold. And now it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> like, now it's perfect. But then, like, I sometimes something will just happen. I think it's when I turn my hand towards it that it gets, like, yeah. really warm. And then yeah, when you go backwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's when I put my hand up. Like, it, it, when it sees my hand and that's, like, the majority yeah. of the thing. It goes, oh. Because it's a white... Nah, mine's... Mine's... dude mine i was talking this is what i'm saying like, but yeah so a lot of people sorry clubhouse podcasting... has that clubhouse has that it has the value of people where no, no, everybody no, no, no. is going to be talking Let... about good shit no you say or no here's the thing uh when i hold rooms with when i hold rooms specifically targeted to the people that i have within my own circles one of the things that i would constantly have to one of the things that I had to say once was, hey, I would rather you have an idea and go to cut me off yeah, than have awkward silence between things. Right. And a lot of times it was, it's people that are great and super knowledgeable, but they wouldn't because they were great and super knowledgeable and because they had respect for other people, they didn't want to, they were scared of they didn't want to step on other people's toes and they didn't want to be destructive. So they kind of learned to always like let the, let yeah. whatever thing finish. And then if there was open space, then they insert. Exactly. Instead of sometimes making the space to keep the conversation running smoothly and not having like a empty. Yeah. Gap. It's hard, dude. It's hard. And I, and I, and I know it's going to sound basic, but I listened to so many fucking Joe Rogan podcasts. Dude, I listened to hours, thousands, I think talking? thousands of hours already. One and I just, got it you know like i understand yeah. how he like tries to do it and i'm not a, like you know i'm a fucking beginner in this but that's what he does he's able to like like go back to a certain point he's able to like take a conversation and whenever somebody starts derailing he brings them back but with someone as kanye for example i don't know if you saw the kanye episode bro kanye like was going on a 
Kanye was jumping like from one point to the other, right. and he was allowing him to. Why? Because that's Kanye's thing. That's he's spewing so much shit that you're not gonna stop somebody, you know. And but with other people who are just going on tangents that have nothing to do with podcast, he brings them back, you know. Yeah. So it's understanding what's relevant in the conversation. Yeah. You know. And it's also, and this is the kind of things that I have trouble. Like, I think I feel that in order to get better at something, you have you need to understand what you suck at in order to yeah. be better. One of the the parts of you know hosting these conversations that I've continued to need to challenge myself with in order to improve upon is letting there be a little bit more space or letting there having a little bit more patience for people to finish. Like even when you were just going, I was like, yeah, and because I would keep and same, like, I do the same. You would you would have what I'll do is I and I used to be a lot worse at this, but I used to be god awful at realizing when somebody was actually done finishing a point yep <laughs> because it was like when when you would say a sentence for you it might be the middle of a sentence because there's like an and something coming mm-hmm. but it's like yeah man blah 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 blah, blah, blah. and then i go oh yeah and and but you would be in the middle of an exactly idea going with an and and i would be it would look like i'm trying to cut you off but it was just because my brain didn't like i would legitimately think you were done somebody shattered my ego with that and showed me he was like okay let's sit down and think about what that action is it's arrogance why one you think that why do you why do we interrupt because i interrupt personally because i i am scared that i'm going to forget a great idea that just arrived yep. because of something that you said i don't know how much longer you're going to talk for I don't know if I can hold on to that idea. It's an arrogance, number one, because we think our idea is the fucking shit and it's more important than whatever they're saying. And the reason why you think it's that they're done is because you just stop giving a shit, like actively listening to what they're saying. So you're yeah. like, oh, they're just done. They're just, they, I'm just hearing sounds that I don't care about. Like, it's a micro moment that it happens in, you know? But I think that somebody explained to us, like, that's one of the reasons why you do it. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to lose this idea. But, or, and this idea is so interesting to me that I completely tone out what you're saying for like two, three words, and you're like, okay, I'm not listening anymore. Like, that's what goes on in people's minds, I think, when they interrupt. The other not side always, it, you know, but... The other side of it, on top of the arrogance, it's also, like you said, it's the fear. Like, I'm going to lose yeah. this side. It's the lack of confidence that you can remember an idea. Right. <laughs> or or thinking that if you're not going to remember it, it's going to be the fucking end of the world. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, that, if that idea is so... like. It's the greatest idea ever, bro. Sometimes you forget what you're going to say. It's okay, you know? And some people want to interrupt because they're like, oh, no, but this, but this, you know? I'm like, you know, but that's what we do because we're passionate about what we do, you know? We're passionate about what we do. So, of course, you're going to want to say that. And it's like one of the the big skills in conversation, like, you need to be able to track things over lengths of time. You need to be able to remember the old ideas. Like, if you watch comedians run a podcast, and I've started to notice this a lot, one of the most challenging and key things that they do consistently across like every comedic podcast i've watched is they will reference something that happened earlier callback yeah callback it's i don't know if that's the name of it is the strongest humor point sorry i interrupted again you see i'm horrible yeah no that's (laughs) great every comedian no but like the other part is like sometimes you need to recognize like oh yeah this is the title for that and this applies in this moment Yeah, yeah 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 And so it's like sometimes you you need to to step in and yeah, insert yeah. that idea, and it's like you learn a rhythm to it, and that rhythm is like what people who have been doing it like Joe Rogan for years like they get good at is like they know like I'm sure Joe no- Rogan knows when oh I need to insert this right here because it's a clarifying point, or I need to insert this right here to keep this on track, versus I can remember my idea. I, this can wait until he finishes the point. This can wait until she finishes the idea that she's on right now. Right? He knows how to separate sometimes the from who the person is or what their status is. He had like a fire conversation, like good argument, but very, very fires argument with the CEO of Whole Foods on a Whole Foods plant or a Whole Foods diet, which is mostly plant based diet with some meat at first and then later no meat he the ceo argued that that's the healthiest diet for longevity and for heart uh, for treating heart disease and preventing heart disease and joe 
was, you know, he has his research done as well or whatever, and he was arguing the other side, but he was arguing at one point, he was like, bro, he called the 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 CEO of Whole Foods, bro. He's yeah. like, bro, you don't understand. And he was, what he does well is like, it doesn't matter who is in front of him yeah. or what you do, but it does, like, he knows when to pay attention to who the other person is and he knows when to pay attention to just the conversation and the words, yeah. not who you're talking to, you know? He that's why he's to, good. He knows how to call BS on something that should have BS called on. Yeah, yeah, he's not scared to call BS or he's not scared to prove a, to, to, um, prove a point or bring up a point that's going to be yeah. against somebody who's important. Like, oh, I don't want to, like, tell them against them. I want them to like me, you know? He doesn't yeah. have that. You, and know? you know what the other thing that is really key to having really good conversations is knowing when to go deeper on a tangent and when not which is something to I've, stop. I've realized how to do that because like for example when you said that right there i could have used that as an opportunity to go hey yeah and like i you know i agree with joe rogan that i feel like that the healthiest hat the, the healthiest diet like differs for different people. yeah we could have jumped but on like, a totally for, different track for this podcast and the conversation we're having is like that's not really a tangent that i that might be useful for the listeners whoever's listening to this right now we're on yeah. this tangent of like having good conversation and that's not really the purpose of this conversation so although it may be an interesting point and something we could go into later it's not to the core of the the podcast the podcast so, right yeah yeah and a lot of times we'll have especially when you're starting out podcasts like for example we touched on a fuck ton during yeah, this bro. entire episode right I'm going to have to add chapters to that, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to listen to all of this, you know? I do it anyways, but... Yeah, and I think there's a lot that, um, you know, as you continue to have podcasts, right, you, you learn a little bit better how to stick to a theme throughout an episode. Yeah. And that's something that it takes... It's It's challenging, especially... That's one of the really difficult things about being a moderator in like a bigger room on clubhouse is keeping the conversation centered and knowing when to reset the room and do stuff like that which a lot of people it's a lot of things that people come on clubhouse and they don't understand they just do things and that's why people have bad experiences because they they think that having a conversation is so easy and they don't look into what actually makes a good clubhouse moderator what makes a good room right and even me like i i don't know i've only been on here for a month but i i can tell somebody who actually consciously thinks about how they're doing something and looks at how they're running a room to to grow from it the next time and the people who just come on and think that they could just have a conversation and have people listen right and like i'm still learning for example this morning i started a room it was like it was on the clubhouse update i was like new clubhouse update follow for follow rooms and blue check marks there um they're now against the terms of service right so i was like okay. funeral for follow for follow rooms and uh whatever i <laughs> i had had a conversation with someone with a couple few people in a room last week about that exact topic about follow for follow rooms how they're straight garbage so i start the room i wait I, literally by myself but eventually jay one of the guys who was, we had the conversation with last week hops in the room we're having a good conversation. Um, we had like 15 people in the room. And then he had scheduled something for his club to talk about it. And I was like, oh, we could just jump in there. His club is a little bit bigger. So when it when it gets to the time that he scheduled, like I had told everybody in the club that in the room that we that I would be moving over. And at 930 we jumped over. I jumped over to his room and I realized that the vibe that he was setting in his room was a little less focused on the actual clubhouse thing. It was mm -hmm. a different kind of vibe. And the people that he was bring that he brought into his room, it, uh, like, simple. Now it was down to, like, nine people, and the room wasn't going to grow. Like, it's just, it, that, it was just meant to be, like, a smaller conversation. Meanwhile, I was hosting a room that was getting attention yeah attention like i was the hosting room that was getting attention i was just like oh i basically just didn't have confidence in actually just letting this keeping space it have value yeah. right and i gave up on that space and then as soon as i went to the other room and was there for like 15 minutes i was like it i could have i could have given more value by hosting that room and yeah. keeping with the people that were in there versus just giving up and basically giving up that room to go into somebody else's room where i wasn't a moderator yeah. To go and talk about the subject. 
it's a lot. Of, it's a whole new world. I feel like now it's going to be, I hope there's a shift towards that because I, I'm liking the kind of content that I'm listening from you, from what I've been browsing. Um, and I just think that it's a cool place to be and it removes a lot of the bullshit yeah. as well. And there's still going to be bullshit like there is on every single social media, but I think there's new content and it's cool. And yeah. it's new audio content, you know? Everybody was trying to to fucking figure this out. Nobody was listening to radio anymore, right? Nobody was. So they started podcasts. Nobody was like, now that some people don't want to be on video anymore, they, they found out that insight, you know, over like, for example, at my workplace, in my team, when I was working on Moen, no fucking video. Maybe one person had the video on. People didn't want video. So how are we going to keep the conversation going? And I know there's plenty of apps that did a similar structure to Clubhouse. I know that so many tried like have rooms and stuff, but this is the first time that I see either because they put more money behind it, but it's just, it's a nice product. It's a nice, nice product, a nice platform, and it's you know a community why, builder. You yeah. know what I feel like that happened is because of two things. One, it started invite only, so it started really small, and it yeah. wasn't just everybody jumping on at the same time. So it built this like inherent value. Yeah. And this, it built this, I want to be on Clubhouse because important people are on Clubhouse. And then as they did that, they were, they basically let the community build the app. Like, yeah. basically, every, like, it had started where it was just one chat room that everybody was in, which is why OGs, like, the people who have been on Clubhouse since, like, the, over the, like, the beginning of quarantine, like, June, July, yeah, they have multiple, like, tens of thousands of followers just inherently because of the fact that everybody from the original clubhouse all follows each other because that was the only way to exist right that's incredible and you touched up on a, po on a point that yeah. i want to kind of segue into the final well, part of this quick, tell me tell me, me. i want to yeah yeah no no that's fine that it was about, about the value they, that you said yeah as they continued as they continue to hold the app everything that exists exist because somebody had started doing that and then they built it into the app like the welcome rooms happened because somebody was holding rooms or yes first it was the 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 founders were hopping into rooms every time somebody jumped in they would jump on the app start a room and welcome the person in but then there yeah. were other people that would start uh having these welcome rooms to jump people in so then they hand it off to like so the people that were onboarding could hop in the room when somebody hopped in to onboard them into the app and then the whole uh support web page on clubhouse the 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 document of all of the knowledge it's basically a knowledge base yeah. was created yeah. because somebody in the community had built it and then they're like oh we want to take this and make it into a website that's basically part of the the clubhouse infrastructure and they're like okay so then they built that into the sub uh it's one of like the support that join clubhouse.com thing there's a way to get to it from there but it's an actual knowledge base that was created by people that were on Clubhouse. It's a good example of paying attention to what the users actually want and need and not what you think and your research says. Yeah. I, like, that's what it is. And like I was saying, and that segues good into the other point, which was value. You brought up value. And um, people are starting to realize that in order to be taken seriously, you cannot just assume that you can sell information. Like we said, we're in an era where information's everywhere and it's for free. You can get your fucking degree online. You can get take Harvard coding courses for yeah. free online. And that's what I'm thinking. Like val bringing value through content and bringing enough value through your content is the only way. I I'm hoping that this is the only way that people are going to start getting followers. I don't know if you saw Facebook remove the like button from uh, public pages. Mm. Yeah, they're steering towards um, they're steering towards followers. So you're gonna still be able to see how many followers they have. I think. Well, not not followers. Like you know, instead of likes, it's gonna be like how many people are like gaining, like gauging the community. You know, followers. Yeah. But they're not doing likes anymore. Um, yeah. I don't know if, if that has something to do with it, but I just hope that we have a shift towards content that is like, hey, I'm genuinely gonna give you something that's going to help you. Like I'm gonna go into a room and tell people how I got this much money on, on Fiverr for free. And then I'm going to later hop on into a call well, that I know somebody else is going to tell me, no, 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 not, not, not selling anything. Like I'm going to tell them like, Hey, I did these three things in my Fiverr and it helped me so much. You should do them too. 
and getting caught on a call and somebody tells you, dude, do this thing every day as your routine because I've done it and look where I've gone and you can uh, increase your productivity. And then you go do it and you get service back. So I hope it's not only like follow for follow anymore, where it's like value for value, service for service, you know? That's what I want it to be. That's why I'm trying to create all this content for free. Let's think about this though, real quick. Because yeah. nothing, I, I want to clarify when you say free. Yeah, what it's it a is. it's a tricky word. There's not nothing because free. A, a lot of the content that you're talking about that's free, it's not free. It's just not the consumer that's paying for it. Yes, and that's what a lot of people understand. It's like when they go to YouTube and they see free videos that are like super informative. Those aren't free. Somebody's paying you to host them. Ads. <laughs> yeah, like you watch ads and those ads. Exactly. That ad money is going to the people that create the content. Or you pay for YouTube Premium, like I do, and you don't yeah. watch ads, but then you're giving $10 money. to YouTube every month. You, you're paying for it, yep. right? And then that that some people just look – There's a, the misconception is a lot of people are just like, yeah, no, it's free. And then when people go to like charge for the same thing, then they go, oh, why are you charging for it? Somebody's offering it for free over here. And it's like, no, it's not free. They're still yeah. getting the 20 bucks over there. Right. It's just not coming from you. Right. And over here, they're offering something that's a little bit more value. And if you want to see that, then you have to pay for it yeah. to, directly to them because they don't want to have to have YouTube as a middleman. Even sadder than that, I know you've heard this, is when you're not paying for something, you're the product. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. When, like when you get a t-shirt from Abercrombie & Fitch... And it has Abercrombie and Fitch printed in gigantic letters yep. on the shirt. And you're like, yeah, I got it for like 15 bucks. Why do you think you got it? You you got it for cheaper than some other companies because of the fact you're a walking billboard now. You're walking ad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. And that's what when I learned that in, it was like when they put it, I think it was in the social dilemma. But I've known that before. Social dilemma is just a surface hitting the surface, you know, for people that never yeah. heard about the big data and what they know and don't know, they were yeah. saying like, bro, if you're not paying for a service, it's because you're being sold to advertisers. On social media, you are the product. The social media yeah. company is being, like it's selling you to the advertisers, selling your information to the advertisers. Yeah. I was talking to Mark about it and I was like, dude, I don't know if there's going to be ever a time in there where this uh, owning your data is going to be possible and companies are not going to have it. But if they're going to have it, give me some more value from my own data other than ads and analytics on how my posts are doing. Tell me some things about myself. Don't give me all because you are, after all, in the data business, right? I understand that you cannot give away all my data to myself because then it means that, you know, you're not having a business anymore. But no, but you know what the interesting Show me thing some is? stuff other than what I listen to on Spotify every year, you know? You want to see something that's interesting, though? And this yeah. is something that got brought up in another conversation was... Uh, what does it look like when you technically inherently own your own data? Yeah. And the like the the media companies need to buy it from you. Yeah, yeah. Because you can already sell your data. Because everybody's yeah. like, oh, I want my own data, and like, because right now Facebook makes money off of people's data and sells it to advertisers. Right? Yeah. What happens when you can just sell your own data to advertisers? Facebook is so rich because they're taking your data and giving it to them. But what if yep. you just take, like, what if I take my own data and then give it to them? I could probably make like five bucks, right? Yeah. Like each person's data is probably worth a couple dollars. Yes, a, a lot. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's one. And then two, uh, some I want to expand on a little bit. Uh, which goes back to Stai is that whole thing about being a walking billboard for the stuff that you have. That's half the reason why <laughs> I made these shirts. This is like, I got tired. And the reason why I want to get rid of my water bottle that has my school on it. And I want to get my yeah. own water bottle with my own stuff on it, or just like blank. So I can put my own stuff on it. I don't want, I want to be, I don't want to be advertising anybody's stuff, but my own. That's so and smart, dude. That I That's so own. dope. I like that. I like that. 
And that's so that's you want to make it all like them. your brand, your bottle, yeah. your brand, your thing, your brand, like your pens, your I love yeah. the pens that you sent and me too. Like everything, like your brand is nice. And that's the thing. It's like I I want the things that people. I want each part of what I'm doing to have a, for lack of a better term, I'm sure there's a better way of putting it, but like a story behind it that is attached to me, right? When you watch, I don't know why this is the one that came to mind, but when you watch like the Proud Family, right? Yeah. That little cartoon, it's like they all wear the same out. Penny has the same outfit on every single episode. <laughs> when you watch SpongeBob SquarePants, Yep. He has square pants. Yes. <laughs> that's the whole, that's like half the, the part of the, the show brand. is yeah, the his square name. pants. <laughs> yeah. Right? And when you, even if SpongeBob wasn't in the square pants, you know where the square pants came from. I just smacked my mouth. Yeah. You know where the square pants came from. Right. Right? So it's like, and then also, it, and this is something that I consistently do now is creating this association between yourself and something else. So every single time I get on a Zoom call now, that isn't like me kicking it with a songwriter or me just kicking it with a friend. Like every time I'm on a Zoom call to do something or to have a business meeting, I'm wearing a sty shirt for that exact reason. Every time yeah. I go out, I'm wearing the sty hoodie for that exact reason. Every yeah. time I do anything that is public at all, I'm wearing something that they will now associate with me and that like, when they see me again, they're going to see me in the same exact thing. I wear the same right. exact suit every time I wear a suit now. And it's also not a black suit. It's like a burgundy red suit. Right. I saw it. It's a cool Partly one. I like because it. Because it was the only suit that I had that fit me well. But then <laughs> afterwards, I was like, all right, well, like, I've gotten compliments for like this suit. And also, it does fit me really well. And I like it. And I like, you know, how lively the color is. Of this course. is just going to be the suit that I wear every time. Now I don't have to. And it's also decisions that you eliminate. Right. Because the more time you waste on decisions, the more time. A lot of people talk about on that, decisions yeah. on something that isn't super important. That you could be using for something else. Yeah. I'm cool with that. I, I, I used to do that all the time. I have printed my own hoodies. I have so many things on my own that I, yeah. you know, that I have, but that's the thing. I didn't think about, okay, I'm going to put one thing and that's going to yeah. be the thing. You know, I was always the yeah. guy who was throwing shit around. They were like, can't keep up with you, bro. What what yeah. are you? Which one of these things are you? So I, I really like this. And it's a simple t-shirt. It's yeah. a t-shirt that it's not like, oh, it's a graphic t-shirt. I got to choose. No, it's a it's a simple like, dude, I wake up in the morning and just, I got to get to work, right? Boom. Yeah. Black that's t-shirt, think, cool I, logo. So it's not completely black. Yeah. That's it. And I know it'll work. Like the reason why I can wear it on any Zoom call is because it doesn't matter what my background is. I have a black shirt. It fits with anything. Yes. I, it's black and white. It fits with everything. It's clean. It feels nice. So I'm comfortable in it. Um, and then whenever I'm not wearing this shirt, I literally only wear cut t-shirts. So they're, they, yeah. they're <laughs> cut like this. Like they're torn the same way because I don't, and I have like a pile of them. The way I do it is it's literally just like a pile of like the six cut t-shirts that I have. No, it's like yeah. four or five cut t-shirts that I have. And I get up in the morning and I'm either wearing the same one that I'm already wearing or I take a shower and then I grab a new one and then I just put yeah. it on. And then once I finish the pile, I just wash the clothes and then make the pile again. And the Good. shorts that I wear is the same exact. No I have four. No, I have five pairs of the same exact shorts and I'm wearing them right now. I'm not even kidding. Like this short, <laughs> I wear the same shorts every single day. Every single day. It's the same pair of shorts. Dude. Fabletics men's shorts, by the way. I fucking love <laughs> them. They have a belt loop and they have a zipper on the pocket. I can't, bro. I, I, I mean, I have, I, I definitely see the value in that. And I definitely have a heavy rotation of stuff. Yeah. But I'm a dude who really likes like dressing in different colors and stuff. Yeah. I'm now a bit less than before just because, you know, you don't leave the house, which is, hey, was I dressing for myself or for other yeah. people? But sometimes I, I like dressing up in the fucking house because I love well, wearing my stuff. And sneakers, dude, I have just way too many things and i know i'm like a consumer and i'm buying stuff that you don't really need and it's a lot of stuff no, no, no. but i, I just appreciate want... like nice design you know and it's not i know it not neither side is like correct or wrong it's just yeah what aligns with your goals and what you want to do and what makes you feel good it's not even that it's mostly like so it's having the differentiation between times when you're like i want to have this decision like if i'm going to go out 
or I'm or I'm gonna go do something or I'm gonna play a show, maybe I won't be wearing the style t shirt. Yeah. I won't be wearing the same pair of shorts. Right? I wanna wear something that is like a nicer outfit, right? But when there isn't that when there's just the, the usual, when I'm just doing the same task that I when I just need to get up and go to work. Right. Right? It's I'm eliminating all of the extra time. And when I want to have the when I have the time where I want to consciously make decisions, like I want to wear something different today, then yeah. I can make that decision then. Otherwise I'm not consistently wasting time on trying to put together an outfit every day. You know what I mean? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like it 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 it's putting the intentionality between when you have the when you have something that's unique and also when something's different. Because the other thing that I notice is I wear the same black t-shirt and the same black hoodie and the yeah. same black shorts every single day. When you wear something different, people go, oh, that's really dope. You're like, that that looks really good. That outfit's really, they notice. They don't yeah. take for granted that you like have like the really nice teal blue shirts and the Jordans that match it, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I think it's a good point. I think it's a great point. And yeah. And I, I've just live less with more. I mean, live more with less is what um, my friends. It's not even living more. It's, like, it's making a greater impact on the things that you want to have an impact. On. Because the thing so that putting want people... energy in less things rather than spreading it yeah. out in more. So okay. the 30,000 decisions that normal people would typically make around food. Now I'm making only 10,000 and those, the extra 20,000 decisions I can apply to music. I can apply yeah. creativity because this is a conversation that I've had with a, a bunch of creators over quarantine. I've seen a consistent trend is the more things that you can make steady and the more things you can make into systems and routines and habits yeah. outside of the things that you need to be creative in, the more creativity you reserve for when you sit down to design an app for when you yep. sit down to produce a song, right? Because when you are creative, you, your career is inherently unstable. Your career is inherently changing. Your career is inherently different every single time you sit at the desk. Yeah. And the you need to create this balance between the things that are unpredictable and the things that are. And having that uh, four to six hours during the day that are 100% predictable, where it's like, I know the first what the first hour of my day is going to look like. And I yeah. know that I, I know the omelet that I, the same omelet that I cook every single day, I know it's going to be good fuel and I'm going to feel good until I eat my next meal, which is the same meal that I cook every single day. Right. I yeah. know that I'm going to, my body runs good on that. So I feel like, like highly creative people sometimes though can be the complete opposite of that too, where they're like, Oh my God, I don't want to have any sort of like structure in my life i don't want to have any routine and it's not to say that they're not succeeding like there's a plenty of people who are fucked up but they're succeeding because they are in balance you know but i disagree like, only because if every single one of those people if you look at them there are things that they're explicitly anal about yes yes exactly they're like super and detailed just, about in really their craft differs. or in their whatever they're doing no not yeah. even like there are things that like for example, they have to put on the same socks before they do every single show. Wow, yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like rituals. That, yeah. Yeah, those rituals, like they need the consistent their brain needs the consistency to trust that it's gonna be there. Like they sit down at the same time every day, or they sit down at the same laptop. Or if like yeah. they sit down in a different chair, they're like, No, I can't do this. It doesn't feel right right now. Or yeah. they need the purple light over their head. So they have restraints and they have this like obsessions just not the same ones that we have like yeah, for them being on time for example or waking up earlier this it's not the thing that they need to they're like yeah i need to make sure that this a certain yeah. thing for some reason has to be this way <laughs> they have the yeah they just i've seen from and some maybe there are cases out there that are completely contrary to this but right. every case that i've seen every case that i've talked to people about is there are things that no, it needs to. This needs to be this way. I need to have this. Be I need to. Ha I need this to be reliable, so I that can be on autopilot while I focus on the things that are the creative part. 
Right. That's that makes a lot of sense. Listen, dude, I think that this is a good point to leave it because I want to have you on again. And yeah. um and maybe we it's do been a real pleasure. And and before we... I end though, I wanna I want you to like tell people uh whatever you're about to say, plus yeah. where they can find the brand, where what you they can buy, uh yeah. what other ways you can help them because we've spoken for two hours and we brought value. Now I want you to also um you know for where <laughs> whoever made it this far. Um what are what service do you bring to the table? Who can you help and how can people contact you even for something that's not paid, even for a helping hand? Word. Um, so first I'm going to say yeah. in future shows, I think we should do it on Clubhouse. Especially Yes, we're going to do they, something on Clubhouse. And especially when they uh, allow for in-app recording. Because eventually yes. that's something that they want to build into where it's like we'll run a Clubhouse room and then we as like we can Content. tell all of the moderators that we're recording it. We're telling all the people that are speaking that we're recording it, get all everybody's consent, and then we download the MP3 and then put it up as a podcast. Yep. And that we will definitely be doing for sure. New so content I, I really coming, think, new content forms. Yeah, I really think we should start holding rooms on Clubhouse because, like, this was a great conversation. I feel like you're solid at the conversation thing, and we can we Thank can you. have a solid base between the two of us, and then without bring a doubt, more people on. Um, yeah. So first, I'm gonna talk on Clubhouse because that's like one of the most recent things. Uh, Remy A R E M Y H D Z. So Remy H D Z on Clubhouse. Uh, it's just my face over a purple background. Find me there. I usually moderate like three consistent clubs. Uh, two of which have been. I one is my own called Icons. I try to make a space for us younger generation folk um, that we can come together and talk about what it takes to to build uh, our own empires in an economy and in a space that is unlike any generation before us. Like we were talking about so much of the advice from the older generations. Yeah, it's great. But pretty much every piece of advice we get now, we need to take with a grain of salt because especially now, even something that worked eight months ago does not work anymore. It's a completely yeah. different world. Um, and yeah, it's, it, we need to take everything with a grain of salt. And I think sometimes the best people to talk to about you know how navigating the current world are people that are navigating the current world and navigating as young people in the current world that haven't had a huge um that don't have a, a a starting point higher up the ladder right right um so that's that's one big thing uh second latinx in the music industry that's every sunday the seven clubhouse and uh, Super Gems is another community for great music conversations. Uh, in general, on every other social platform, it's J Remy HDZ. Um, for now, that's that's the one that I got. So that's what we're rocking with. Hopefully, once eventually, when we get trademarks and all that stuff, we can get the, the actual Remy HDZ tags. And uh, I'm a music engineer, audio engineer, producer. I have handled a lot of audio engineering for podcasts, and I'll have it paid on sound better. As well as uh, I'll be, I'm actually in the process of building my own website, which will be up by Sunday. Damn, that's hard. I know yeah. those th moments. Yeah, it's difficult, but it, it's it, I'm trying to get it up by Sunday. It'll just that's be good. RemyHDZ.com, and then if you want to look up anything for Sty the Brand specifically, you can look at StyTheBrand.com. Uh, and I I am reevaluating a lot about the brand, so there's going to be some pivots in the near future, but. Yeah, stylethebrand.com, sign up for the newsletter and get all the updates through there. That's good. You got to keep uh, fresh, you know, yeah, keep the brand I, fresh, keep changing. It's and good. we'll have conversations about that too, but I, I think I had a very, I had a, I had a really big idea for what Style of the Brand could be as the clothing line. Right? Can't wait. And when I came up with it, I was like, this is dope. And now, especially since, you know, the other partners that I was working with have left the company and now it is only myself. Um, I've been reevaluating one, how much time I want to devote to it because of the fact that, well, how much time I want to devote to specifically the clothing line as the clothing right. line, because of the fact I want to do my own, I want to do the music thing. And right now the music thing isn't in a good enough space where I can just like 
dedicate a whole bunch of time to, to the clothing brand. Cause, so it may turn into uh, something I really want to do through Sty, which is always my goal through Sty is to, to provide those engaging opportunities for creatives of the next generation and connect them with role models. That's the whole bi- that's the whole point between every collaboration that we do is telling the story of another creative in the industry to serve as a role model for somebody that looks like them and young, right? Um, and I think I'm going to be carrying that intent into a few, I'm going to be trying a few different ways, one of which hopefully is talking at high schools, another which is like, you know, community programming and trying to connect with people within industries and education initiatives and stuff like that. So pursuing through different mediums that I'll be doing, you will see a lot of music stuff coming from me within the next couple of weeks. So yeah, RemyHTZ.com, JRemyHTZ on all social media platforms, RemyHTZ on Clubhouse specifically. Listen, man, this was exciting and it's exciting to hear your projects and it's exciting to see somebody like you that's putting out a lot of content and doing all this, putting it towards a good cause. Yeah. It was a pleasure to have you on here and I hope the people that are listening got, you know, at least entertainment, if anything, they got yeah. it out of it, entertainment for a bit, but also hopefully we sparked a few ideas. Yeah. Hopefully we triggered a few people. I really hope so. And, <laughs> you know. Hopefully we trigger change, if anything else. At the very else. least, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. It's been a conversation at the best of it. Yes, I'm, it's been a, it's been an awesome down yeah. time I to sit with you. To do this again, either on Clubhouse or something else. For sure, for sure, yeah, yeah for sure. And we'll let everybody I'll know when we do that meeting later this week. Later next yeah, week. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. Thank you so much, Remy. Everybody, this is episode fifteen, bro. I can't believe it. Episode by episode, I can't wait to have you on again. Yeah. Have a good one, man. Peace. Thank you so much. Peace. Take care.